All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ashland Planning Board meeting of Thursday, April 11th. Um, a reminder that the session is being um, uh, broadcast and recorded. So first on our agenda tonight, well, first I will call the meeting to order at 636, and then we always have a clerk's report. Kate? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. We've received one email correspondence to the Planning Board since the last meeting. All right, thank you. Um, next on our agenda is um, we start our public hearings. They don't go that quickly. <laughs> um, and the first one is 6 Chestnut Street site plan approval application. This is, we are just opening this this evening. Um, and this is, just for the audience out there, this is the old Dairy Queen building, which has been sitting there for quite a while now yes uh so just to to lead into it uh first this this application was was scheduled to open on march 28th due to some office difficulties notification wasn't provided uh to the abutters and so therefore i just want to say thank you to the to the applicants for their patience uh but we're here tonight so to get started i'm just going to read the public hearing notice into the um record so please um bear with me um i'm going to hold off a second Hey, Mackie, yeah. I just got a text that the, the volume is not working. The volume on the Zoom or the volume on? on the Online. Online? Yep. Should be. It's coming through. One second. Okay. Technical difficulty. It's coming through on the YouTube stream. Okay. Um, can they hear the Zoom? Is that? Uh, Anna, I assume you can hear us? Anna? Are other people Anna, are you the same able to hear issue? us? She's the only one on the screen. Hmm. I don't know. Did you text Anna as well? You know what? It's my fault. It's your fault. Mm -hmm. Anna, Anna, can you, can you hear, hear us? us? It doesn't look like it. Oh, she's. No, I just I made her a co host. But she should still be able to hear. Yes. Yep, yep, I just, I just. She's in. Make co host. Yes. She should have the ability to unmute herself. Does the other laptop have the audio on because you're echoing? So it's on. Yeah. yeah. Mine as well. Okay. All right. So, 
I, I believe we have our audio working to various sources. So um, if someone's out there listening to us or getting a stream, well, I guess if they can't hear us, they can't hear me give instructions. They'll just have to text. Okay, um, six, Nest Chest six Chestnut Street, Peter, I think you were going to read the um, public hearing. Correct. Okay, the Ashland Planning Board. The Ashland Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Thursday, March 28th. Due to the situation, we are now opening the hearing tonight on April 11th. In the second floor hearing room in Ashland Town Hall, 101 Main Street, this public hearing can be joined via Zoom video conference. Please see the Planning Board agenda for this link. The Planning Board will hear the petition of Adrian um, Machado requesting site plan review and design review per Chapter 40A, Section 6 of the Massachusetts Zoning Act and Chapter 282, 9.6 design review and 9.4 site plan review of the Ashen Bylaws. The applicant is proposing, proposing to revitalize the former Dairy Queen, uh, currently a vacant commercial property, and repurpose it into a fresh produce market. The lot area of the site is 18,000 square feet and will have adjustments within the existing parking area. An additional small landscape area and a minor additions to the existing single story building. The property in question is located at 6 Chestnut Street, Assessor's Map 14, Lot 474, Deed Book 48356, page 462, and is within the Highway Commerce Zoning District. Parties wish to be heard on this matter should submit comments to the Ashland Planning Board ahead of time and or appear at the time of place indicated above. Materials may be viewed on, by appointment at Ashland Town Hall during the normal business hours link provided. For more, for more information, please submit comments to uh, and or contact Peter Matchak and I'll list my office number and my office email. So at this point, I will introduce the applicant. Um, and I already, uh, so Alan is here as a friend and as an interpreter um, and uh, for the applicant application team. And then also Terry from Applewood Survey is here uh, to go over and review the site. So the site is going is located at Six Chestnut Street, the old former Dairy Queen, and the purpose is to uh, and the proposal is to reinvest and to revitalize that site, uh, a site that's been vacant for ten years, um, and to create a produce market selling meats and produce and maybe some sandwiches, um, and so that is overall. The, the proposal in front of us. There are some additions to the site. I just want to make a note that this application uh, has been heard by the Conservation Commission. Uh, it is within jurisdictional due to the Sudbury River. Um, and the Conservation Commission this Monday night um, approved um, the proposal here. Uh, and so I will let Terry kind of walk us through the, the site plan. And if you want to make a note of uh, any conversations that you have with the conservation agent, that would be great. Um, but I do just want to make a note that this is in the floodplain. It's within jurisdictional boundaries of the Conservation Commission. And that was within that memo that I sent out uh, to, the, to the planning board. And furthermore, the applicant uh, survey, Terry, the applicant survey, Terry, was able to submit a kind of a color um, site plan just to kind of identify some of the items that we may uh, well, what he'll present tonight. So, with further ado, I'll let Terry introduce herself. So, if you're putting a hand down, it's just a zero on this, just so you can see it a little better. I know it's small. I'm sure you're all. Do you want to do any of I could kind of hear it. Yeah. Anyway, so I think it's. Okay, um, the, I'm, you're, I'm sure you're already familiar with the site, what's out there, but just real quick, um, virtually the entire property is paved with the exception of a little spot over here, the area down right adjacent to the river and a small little section up at the uh, intersection itself. It has parking there, 25 spaces. Almost all of them don't conform to current sizes and the aisle widths also are not. Uh, conforming to anything that the, the 24 foot wide width that typically uh, at least emergency services likes to see. Um, so uh, just real quick with regard to conservation, I've stayed out of it. I let Susan MacArthur take care of it all. 
We are we within are most of the properties within the flood zone, fortunately for this, pro for this application. The only area that's outside it, which is above it, is right around the corner here um, and uh, a little bit over on this side here, which is just enough for us to be able to replicate that um, uh, flood storage that's going to be lost. The reason we're losing flood storage, the orange area along here are additions that they want to put on the property. Off the, the right-hand side, as you're looking from Union Street, there's, I believe it's a walk-in uh, refrigerator or freezer or something that Dairy Queen used to use. They're just going to square off, square off the building right there. This area in the front actually is on top of that concrete pad that you would have stood on if you were ordering from Dairy Queen in there. It's got the overhang above it. So they're basically just going to drop down from the, the, that overhang, the, the facade of that overhang, right down to the... Uh, to the top of the concrete pad and then just square it off around the side over there. Um, back to the, uh, the conservation issues again. Because these, a, a portion of these um, uh, additions, which is in the upper left corner over there of, of the plan, uh, is going to fill in some flood zone, we had to replicate it on a foot by foot basis. So the way we're doing that, it, it's, this sort of is a twofold thing. Uh, in order to, play, to provide a little bit of landscaping in front, um, uh, all we needed to do is take the pavement out of this area right in here and drop the whole thing down three inches. And that three inches is supposed to be top of the mulch after they're done. So they may go down four or five inches in order to put a couple inches of mulch on top of that. There will be an as boat required by conservation at the end of this thing to prove that they did it right. And conservation, I'm sure, will have jurisdiction to go and check over years over the years to make sure that all of a sudden this isn't all getting piled up in here because they don't take out the old stuff and put in the new. Um, so uh, the uh, so that'll be the replication area on there. Um, trying to make it look a little bit better, we're going to do some plantings up there, but we're kind of bound by um, plants that the Conservation Commission would like to see out there uh, because we are in in flood zone area and within the Rivers Act area. Um, so uh, I had Susan MacArthur, who's more familiar with plants than I am for this area here, um, is proposing four azaleas and three fetter bush. I don't even know what that is, but hopefully it's, it's nice looking. And those are going to go up in the front over here, spaced across the whole area. And then we're taking out, there's a retaining wall that runs right along this, uh, in between the, the river and the parking lot. And the pavement goes right up to that, uh, that um, Retaining wall. We're taking out a 10 foot strip all the way along here. Um, that's going to be regrassed again. It's not going to be filled in at all because we can't do that because flood zone. Um, they're putting six arborvitae along that stretch in there just to provide some screening from, I guess, the Chinese restaurant. Um, there are, you know, a bunch of trees and stuff in here, and when the leaves come out, that'll that'll sort of block things from the from the river. This will also provide a little bit of, um, you know, right now the general. Uh, flow of the water goes in this direction, you'll get some infiltration um, down along here. This lot is very, very flat. The water doesn't move, doesn't move very fast across it at all. Um, just so you're aware, uh, Union Street is 60 feet wide right here. When they put this concrete sidewalk in, it doesn't look like it's all that old. That's raised up about six inches off the existing pavement. Um, normally the sidewalks will go back, you know, put a little gap in between the pavement and the sidewalk, but they put it right up to, next to the street, which is fine. But the, the town actually owns from the, the back edge of that sidewalk, you know, probably seven or eight feet down on this side, and you know, probably five feet as it get up around here. They clipped over onto the locust property as they went around the corner a little bit. Um, so there's a, a this strip of pavement in here. We're putting this flood storage area and the uh, landscaping in that right of way and the reason we decided to do that is because we thought it would look really strange if we just left this strip of concrete pavement on the back side of the sidewalk and it had this little island of of, uh, of landscaping up there it also helped with uh, allowing us for nice aisle widths all the way around the building which i'm pretty certain emergency services was very happy to have in there um, the, as far as the colors go in here, we, we dropped it down to a total of 19 space, 19, 18 spaces. The, he doesn't need that many. I have a calculation down the bottom for what they're doing. Seven spaces are required, but the owner of the property wants to make sure that in the future, if changes ever happen, he's got that grandfathered in. 
he could always come back in the future and say, yeah, I know there's a flood zone, but I'll put it up on piers and, and build a slightly b bigger building, with, obviously with your approval, um, get through conservation with the flood issues on there, but need the extra parking in there, which is why he wants it. Um, the conservation kind of wanted him to take out a little more pavement, but again, because he doesn't want to lose what he's already got, and if that pavement comes out, he'll never get it back. Um, he, he wants to maintain it the way it is. So I've highlighted on the colored sketch here, all the purple areas around the, the edges here, those are all the parking spaces, and again, those all conform to current parking requirements. I also put right next to the building right here a uh, sort of a delivery spot. I expect that they probably will have no more than like a box truck showing up for uh, whatever they're having supplied here. That can easily come in off of Chestnut Street, go around the building park right there. There's a door right in the back of the building they can unload and then they can drive right out on Chestnut Street without any problems um, coming in and out. And that still leaves the 24-foot aisle coming through there. That spot is intended, with the exception of deliveries, to be empty most of the time. Um, so there shouldn't be any, any weaving around cars or anything um, with people parking over there. At least they shouldn't be parking over there. We're providing one dumpster in the back over here. The reason I chose that spot was, again, for ease of, of access. Garbage truck can come in off Union Street, straight in, pick up the dumpster, go right back out to just on Street and out without any issues, no three-point turns or something in the site over there. There is a little bit of pavement that goes on to the next-door neighbor's property. We are removing that permanently, uh, and, and um, it will just be whatever they use for landscape cover in here, whether it's mulch or it's grass or something that will be done over on their property to replicate um, what has been there probably for decades. Um, for more than likely, no one ever knew where the lot lines were. The light blue area I have around here, those are areas that are going to remain paving but are not part of the parking space areas in there. Um, some of that area can be used for snow storage. I expect snow storage will probably happen along um, the, the southerly border of the property down in here. I, I can't imagine these spaces back here are going to be used very much at all. Um, that's really about all I have to say on this, unless you have any questions. Sorry, just real quick. I think one of the other things that came out of the conversation was, was, was the opportunity for picnic tables on the river. That's possible, I, you know, depending on how big these arborvitaes grow into. They look like they're spaced enough that they're not really going to create a hedge. There might be some space in between them, or they could put, put them right along the, the pavement that's going to uh, remain right along this backside between the end of the parking and the 10-foot uh, strip that's going to be turned back from pavement into landscaping. This area is not meant to be a dine-in type restaurant. You know, if someone comes in and gets some sandwiches, they can go out and, and you know have lunch sitting out in the in the parking lot or something. But it's it's everything is takeout. The, the just again the, the dumpster and I have a detail on there. The dumpster is got a panel fence all the way around it with a gate, just to block uh, the view so no one has to look at it and to uh, try and uh, keep any trash that may happen to blow within that area there. We cannot have that fence go right to the ground for flood issues, so there'd be a few inches up above the ground. Questions from the board? I do have a couple of questions. Um, the, the first one, uh, it just I, the, the plan in general, I think, seems to be very efficient and, and, and well-planned and compliant with even the parking sizes, which we don't see that often. So that, that, that's all good. Um, is, is, is there a reason why the handicapped parking spot is um, placed so further back? I mean, I see the geometry, but is there an opportunity to have that closer to, to the ordering um, spot? Because then a handicapped person is going to have to cross the longest way. Right. The, we, we left the 20-foot-foot the foot foot aisle just so they'd have access all the way around. Um, if you look at the way they had the parking over here before, if you came in off of here and tried to do a 24-foot aisle, you'd have to make an immediate right-hand turn, which probably a lot of cars would be swinging into the parking space in order to get around in that area there. Or they could come out and around in here. Um, this is about 35 feet from the center of the uh, handicapped spot to where the front door is. This is not an ordering type place like, uh, like Dairy Queen was. You will actually go inside. It's like a little mini market sort of thing. Where yeah. The, okay. Um, 
But precisely, so, so there's, no, there's no chance that the space number 13 could be converted into, like, swap it to the other side of the, of the row so that it's closer to that door? The door, is up, the door is up front. So I think I thought you said that the door is on the side, no, that the little door, no, rectangle. There's a, there's a door in the side over here that will be used for deliveries. So where's the other one? The, there's a, the main door is going to be right in front. Mm. When, uh, when, well, we have the sheets in front of us, but when Peter comes back, I'll see if we can put the slides up the, to get the visuals bigger. So that's one question just for, for, for discussion. And, uh, and, and the just, other one? I have no problem. If you want it moved over there, I have no problem doing it. Okay, um, but I will let some the, the others um, opine on that. Um, is there any um, strategy uh, at the in the inception of the of the driveway and and the exit to try to dissuade people from cutting the red light and cross through the through the property? I guess my first question would be: Has that been a problem? I mean, it has. I don't know. Um, you know, I, don't know. I was out there a few days doing the survey work. I do know the police like to sit right here. I've seen a cop there yeah. every now and then, but probably they're not going to be there anymore. So more than likely will. not. Um, is there anything to stop them? You know, I've seen at another site over in Milford where people were doing that at a light, and the it was a, a liquor store, and the guys ended up putting a couple of backhoes right there to prevent for people from yeah. doing that. We obviously don't want to do that, not only from a business standpoint, but again, but you you don't really find the curb cuts, are you? The curb cuts are already there. So you're not going to change any. We're not of that. changing them. So you could not change an elevation or anything to make it a little more, or put like a texture or something. I don't know. Uh, these it's, these uh, these this is all part of that new sidewalk that went in there. The, oh, the, yeah. the aprons that go across. We really want don't want to tear up what they just built. Okay. Peter's just gonna that, put up the images here in a minute just to make it a little easier. I think that's th those were my questions, so I, I'll let everybody comment. I had a question about the, um, and I may have misunderstood this, the, the proposed landscape area in the front, <clears throat> and this was being put in to kind of in trade for the um, addition, right, the space of the addition, is that right? So that <clears throat> uh, The landscape area in the front is being, that's the replication area for the lost flood storage. We're dropping okay. that elevation down a few inches, which is, it might be the width or maybe slightly more than the, the thickness of the pavement that's out there. Um, so that if you do get a flood, this area is displaced, mm -hmm. but that water can go over into this spot over here. So, but you also said, I think that, and, and given the, um, what I think is the property line, so a lot of that is, uh, is on town property uh, yeah, well, yeah, I'm going to say probably close to three quarters of it is. So is that, I mean, maybe it's a question for, I, I'm just wondering, is that allowed? Can, you know, is that for that makeup area of something inside the property to be happening outside the property line? Like, in my eyes, like it is allowed, you know, conservation, you know. It's really kind of in, under conservation, obviously, review, mm -hmm. because it is kind of, it's a, it's a flood storage uh, matter, so, so I think, it is, and I think talking to Becca, there was ample, there was more flood storage than, they're providing more flood storage than they are actually, they're exceeding the flood storage. Far, far more. Far more, yeah. so even having that off, off the, in, in that town right away, uh, that still, from a number standpoint, worked for the applicant. So the extra flood storage is where? It's not in the light blue. No, it's in this green area right up front. That's where the replication's going. Where those azaleas and fetter bush are. Okay, so I was, in, I was, and maybe I'm not thinking about this right. I assume that they would be, I mean, they look roughly the square, same square footage right now, right? What does? The, uh, the addition area and the proposed landscape area. Are those the two things that we're comparing? Am I? No, areas. <laughs> Area isn't what we have to replicate for. We have to replicate for volume. Volume. So you you okay. could do a much smaller area if you just dug a big hole. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. So you're providing in that area much more than you need. Right. Even though the surface area. Right. And, and, okay. And part of the reason for that too was to try and make something that at least looked nice from a landscaping standpoint in the front, rather than just the concrete jungle that's there now. Okay. But, but Trisha, one question: uh, are, what, what what you're getting at 
because that's town property. We um, the maintenance of that area, if something gets degraded, um, is, is there going to be an agreement that the owner will commit to maintaining and not the town? Well, it, it's kind of those two questions. One is, okay, yeah, the sidewalk. What if they do want to put a wider sidewalk in at some point, the town? Hmm. You know, then I guess that would need to be re negotiated right and then yeah the maintenance is a thing too it's not my property it's the town's property so that would have to be a condition i suppose and and i don't think that's a problem my guess is that dairy queen always maintained the pavement that was over there you know, clean it up they didn't want the place to look like a mess i don't think the applicant's going to have a problem saying hey i don't want this to, to look horrible i want people to come into my business and not think it's just a, a rundown uh, a building um keep in mind too if the town decided to widen that sidewalk and put it out my gut feeling is that this sidewalk filled in flood zone and it was never replicated when they did it. If they were to go out there and say, oh, hey, we're filling in their flood zone, conservation's gonna go, hey, wait a minute. Oh, and by the way, all the rest of the stuff you're putting in here too. Um, so that they would have jurisdiction over any, any future uh, uh, stuff that got put out there. So if, if, and I understand we are asking to allow this to be put in the, on the town's property only because we think it's gonna look a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah, just trying to understand. Yeah. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I would have put it down here, but the elevation drops off enough that it goes below the elevation that we need to replicate at. So, I mean. So, that, so the area, the light blue area, just isn't available as replication area because it's too low. Is that? The, we need hmm? to stay uh, in between the 177 contour and the 178 contour. And the 177 hmm. contour. 177 comes right along in through here. But so we would have to dig out an area. Uh, you'd have pavement in cross section. You'd have pavement and you'd have to drop down and you'd pop up back to pavement over here. So you, we could create an island over here. I would push the parking back this way. I'd probably have to get rid of that space, the delivery space, in order to keep the 24 foot aisle over there. Um, but that also eliminates any um, aesthetics in front of the building, too, for I'm, what that's worth. I'm okay with the way the site plan works and everything. I'm just trying to understand, um, and it might be, the answer might sometimes be cost, right? Like if there's this big area of light blue that's pavement not being used as parking, my first thing is like, well, why wouldn't you dig that up and let, let the water soak into the ground? You know, I'm... I, that, that makes sense, and that's what conservation asks could be done. And I go back to what the owner of the property, who's not the applicant, said that in the future, he does it, if that pavement comes up, he will never get it back because of how close he is to the, the Sudbury River. And in case in the future, let's say 20 years goes down the road, these guys have made a million dollars and say, we're out of here, we're gonna go retire. And he says, well, you know what, I have a chance to put an office building in here or, or some other use that requires more parking spaces than what's required right now. He wants to make sure he's got that already in place and doesn't have to try and jump through hoops to try and get something that they probably won't approve that he already has now. So that's from the owner? This okay. is from the owner. Got it. Okay. Well, one last comment, sorry. But, but that given uh, the fact that that's the owner's kind of intent, I would say you could also have a little less parking and create what's needed if the town would say that that's a problem. For example, uh, space number 12, which is at the inception of the driveway, it seems like a car backing out of there will probably go into the in, in, on, onto the the walkway. Uh, could could that space be um, a, a, a similar zone if you don't have it? Again, I had this I had this originally with fewer spaces on there. I was told by the owner he wants jack him up as far as we can. No, I know what I the owner understand. wants. Okay, so w w would this one backing out over here, if it was, let's say, an SUV like a lot of people are driving nowadays? Yeah, it probably would back right out onto the apron a little bit. But it looks like any car, doesn't have to be an SUV, would go into the pedestrian yeah. walkway just to back out of right. there. Okay. Yeah, I agree. You know, I have no problem eliminating it. We have far than, more than enough spaces out hmm. there. But the existing, this image that you see here doesn't look as, tight as what the scale looks on the drawing. If this is the same spot as 
what you're talking about, that looks like that's pretty comfortable for an SUV to back out. Yeah, um, but, that, but that's a forced perspective. I don't think that's uh Yeah, and that's I, real. I wouldn't put a lot of... I don't know how those were made. Okay. Yeah, you, you, you can force the perspective on that program and just that's make it true. look a little wider angle. But, but just by looking at the plan, it, it just like how geometrically, yeah. you can see that just the car, if somebody's walking car, there, yeah. leave the pavement. It's, 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 it's not, it's I, I, not I agree. Safe. I don't have a problem eliminating space number 12. You know, normally I could say, well, let's slide them this way, but then we lose our 24 foot. Now, I could do the 24 foot off the edge of the building itself but they do have a couple of posts out here because their gas service comes in there, the meter's outside, and I really don't want people driving right up next to the meter in there. No. Um, so, yeah. uh, you know, if you object no. to number 12. Just, I, just so I'm clear, I don't have any problem with what's being proposed in the front. Right, um, I understand. On the Union Street, I'm just saying that that parking spot doesn't look safe to I me understand. in the way that it's laid out. If it's a safety issue, 12 should be eliminated. Yeah, well, like, like I said, I think it would be, it'd be good to know I mean, if 12 and the little blue area there, you know, if if that can be used as water, as space. What? If those can be merged. If those can be merged, that 12 and the blue space to, I'm just not sure about this. I, I, read, I understand that conservation is okay with it, but I'm not sure planning is okay with it to be able to use town land right. by an owner that's trying to hold on to all this, you know, all this pavement, which which shouldn't be there. So I'm not, I'm not sure. It, it, and if, if I could, it was not the owner who said put that right there. That mm -hmm. was my decision, and okay. again, that was strictly aesthetic. Okay. Um, if you want us to, to put it in a different spot, I'll probably put a couple of parallel park. Well, again, they're using it right now. Um, we could put a couple of parallel parking spaces in there, so the owner would say, hey, we get some parking, I suppose. Again, they don't need it. I don't mind it being a green space. I have a problem with it being used for to the, count for the to offset. count for the offset when that's a part of the property. Yeah, I don't have I don't have a problem if you want it. It's, it's there, plant it. Great, it, it, it'll look great. It'll be a site improvement. It doesn't have to be that because it, it like you could say no, that's town property. It's that's your problem, right, to the town. But I have a problem with it being used. Um, for to make up for an addition on the site that seems like it should come out of the property then right but if you if, no i understand what you're saying yeah i'm just trying to see for so for future things yeah. that may come up by this board yeah this is so flat out there i'm going to have to look at my spot elevations that i have in here on all the survey points to make sure mm -hmm. that if you did want us to put that replication back there, which means we're going to have to reopen conservation, um, they, uh, that this area is within the same 177 to 178. I'm not sure if this comes up a little bit or goes down a little bit, because I've got a 177 here, 177 there. And I, I'd have to look at my spot elevation to know whether there's a hump, very shallow hump right there, or very shallow coming underneath. Um, I would, yeah, and I'd, I'd be looking for feedback from the board. Are you um, kind of watching Anna if she has a comment because yeah. I keep forgetting that she's there um, in cyberspace. Um, I mean, I, but, I agree with that point. I'm not sure, like, I like that this is, I think everybody in town, let me start, I was very excited about this. Um, that using town property, um, a landscape versus a specific thing feels like we're, we're essentially like giving away something. And I, I mean, we, Lisa Mead's an obvious one to talk to how that would be handled, but it it's an easement, but you're, it's an easement for a condition, which seems a little bit not probably the right way to handle it. Okay. Um, it, what I can do, and this was my first um, design on this thing, and that's when they said, hey, we want the, some landscaping up front. I said, oh, great, I'll just put it over there. Along this edge of the building, that, that flood zone elevation runs right along in here. I originally had them taking out right along where these parking spaces are. Taking that pavement out, dropping that down now in, in, in cross section, and this is exaggerated. This is the end of the parking space, here's the building. Taking that out, lowering this down so the pitch was lower, it still would flow out, and that's where I had my replication area before. Um, but in, you know, in doing that, it, and it doesn't matter to me, if, if, if you do that, um, you won't have any planting or anything up front, we're just gonna leave that pavement the way it is right now. 
And what would that do to the delivery space? Can it the still delivery, be? The delivery space can still be there because we're only be dropping it a couple inches. Okay. Because the area is wide enough that just that little bit of elevation difference makes up for the, the flood storage we're, okay. we're missing. Because we're not really filling in a lot of flood zone in here. Most of this area right across the front over here, that concrete pad is just above the flood zone. So we're okay there. So it's Got just it. a couple little areas over here. We're Got through. it. I forgot that there was already something there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if let's just say now for the benefit of everyone if the town took up the pavement there would would the applicant consider putting landscaping which is sort of getting rid of some impervial service and making it look better if the town took up took up that pavement yep. in there and happened to lower it by three inches mm -hmm. That would work for us. <laughs> but I mean, it, I'm just, we, I don't control DPW or the town budget. We just should, that's what we're here for, to talk about ideas, right? right. Because but aesthetically, if, it, it, it would be an improvement right. for everyone. But I guess my point is the applicant's willing to do this on their dime. Yeah. Yeah, Kate, I, I think that. Um, I, no, I was looking at two things. The applicant, I think, should take care of it on the property, probably. But yeah. secondly, if this can be an improvement, everybody knows that we don't want more permeable surface we want less right so just as part of the project when you're out there doing things if the town took up the pavement would they consider putting landscaping and uh, maybe a benefit for everybody is three inches lower as well but, yeah well, um, I, I think that would fall under basically what you're saying well it's the town property you can't do anything on it so we would say all right fine it's the town property you take care of it yeah i think what what what, what we're gonna what I believe we were trying to get at is to do that landscape area, like you said, because I think your design intent is it's valid, mm -hmm. but not to rely on that to, for compliance, but do the compliance remove uh, parking, uh, parking 12 because of safety concerns. If you can do it there, fine, then you're done. If not, do it the way you mentioned, but do both. And that would be, that, that would be I, a, a good Just to jump in, I think number one, I think we have to check with the volume and how, how our conservation agent, Becca, has calculated volume. Because I want to find that out she first. Doesn't. I do it. You do it? Yeah. Okay. So do you need... That's why it, it's so far over, it wasn't even a question. We, 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 I forgot that, that number is off the top of my head. But, you know, we're filling in this much and we're replicating this much. Correct. So what my question is, is obviously looking at this area, the landscaping area, mm -hmm. right? How much replication is taking part on your property, and how much is that is just an additional vegetation bed? Oh, oh, that's I a see good what question. You know what I'm saying? Because I think I know where the board's going. They're saying, you know what? We're not going to count this whole thing. Yes, this whole thing is being count, counted as replication, right? However, you know, that's actually a good point. I could probably do that because we have 27 feet right here. Correct. We only need 24. I could always pull this back an extra yeah. three feet. Increase. The amount of replication and conservation hopefully would say you're increasing it that's fine we don't need to reopen the hearing and the correct. sliver on your property would grow to take care of what you have to take care that's of correct to grow that to cross that nexus yes. that's great that, and i i can do yeah. i can do a total uh, volume that we're replicating and i can do a volume just on our property just on your yeah. property as long as those meet i think from what i'm hearing from the planning yeah. board is that as long yeah. as those meet what replication is taking place on your property fits the bill everyone's okay with that yeah they just don't want to we just don't want to count the replication that's being take that's being done on the town okay. owned right yeah. away I can do that. towards yeah. the towards on the property that's an excellent idea. and i think with marcella's point of, of parking spot 12 yeah, i understand that i would just merge that that parking lot 12 parking spot 12 with that with that kind of uh, you know cross hatching or whatever you know that with that little blue spot with that little blue yeah. spot you know uh, yeah, just, just emerge it, it. And so when you go back in there, because you'll restripe it, right? Mm -hmm. Is you're just going to restripe it, and you know I don't know if you're, you're going to cross hatch or whatever you do, but it's on a parking spot. Right. But I think to find out that 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 nook of information, right, about what the replication is, is going to be the key point. And again, this is not going to be a problem because if all of a sudden I say, oh geez, I don't have enough area for the room, I'll just go down another inch or another two inches. Okay. Yeah. Can we bring up? Um, yes. Uh, these are the architectural renderings. 
Do you think what we had in our packet? Yep, it's what everyone has in their packet. Okay. So, and can we see the, the view that's straight on with the addition, the, the, front, the front elevation? Yeah, that, yeah, that's good. Um, oh, I didn't realize that the door's a little closer to that handicap spot, probably by about five mm -hmm. feet. I thought it was right in the middle, the door. And just to, just before you go on, Alan, do your clients want to make any kind of a statement about the about the their project or about the property or? So and just to clarify, the program is, as Peter described, meat, produce, yeah. sandwiches, other, okay. All right, so then um, I just wanted us to, since this is an addition as well, it's not just reusing the, the existing building. So those of us have, that frequented the old Dairy Queen many moons ago. Um, so the concrete pad is now that glass, the kind of that glass area in front. The edge of right? the concrete pad closest to Union Street is where that glass goes straight up from. Okay, so that they're extending. Eight feet. The, and the roof, is the roof already, mm -hmm. the roof is already there. It's an overhang. So it's just enclosing. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, so right now it's a symmetrical building, right? With the roof? I think so. So down the, down the Chestnut Street side, they're just extending that roof to cover I don't remember. Does it already cover the freezer? No. I don't believe it. It doesn't. No, I think okay. I know where you're going. And yes, that if looking at the front, it will no longer be symmetrical. No longer be symmetrical. So it'll be. Oh, you mean the gambrel is not symmetrical? The gambrel will no longer be symmetrical, yeah. which I'm not sure I have a big problem with. I'm just, I'm just try making sure we look at it, right? So, and then that extra square footage inside, I just assume just, they just extra programmatic space right on that side. Yes, and that's an addition of 5.8 feet off the side. I can. There it is. That, that shows it asymmetrical. Uh, you can see it would be this side right here. Yeah. And then this side right here. They will probably too re-landscape that area right on the corner that's already there. That's up, that's above the flood zone right in that area. They will be putting a sign on the signpost that already exists. And you know, there are a couple, I think they're used that are kind of overgrown to probably make that area look a little bit better too. Okay, so, um, yeah, so I see there's lighting added to the side that as well. The architect added some lighting along the, uh, the along the side of the building. Okay. Yeah, I'm just bringing these things up because eventually, sooner rather than later on a project of this scale, we'll need to go through the conditions that we're required to go through for a site plan review. You know, and um, also it'll be going to the design review Correct. committee. And one of the things that we had talked about with um, Starbucks, this print is terrible that you have. I stuff. agree. Um, is about one of the things um, that may come up is the consistent a consistent visual identity shall be applied to all sides of the building all sides of the building visible to the general public now you take that to mean the streets kind of before you go in not when you circle around the back of the building so in this case obviously I mean that's kind of how it always has been even I don't think there's anything on that side um, any windows or anything on that side but I'm just bringing it up as something that that might come up with our criteria if we if we need to discuss that. Um, also, I just wanted to go through quickly so people have in their heads the conditions of site plan review. This is not a special permit site plan review, and I'll just run through those, make a note of anything that uh, that you think of. 
Um, one, minimize use of wetlands, steep slopes, floodplains, and hilltops. Two, minimize obstruction of scenic views. Three, preserve unique natural or historic features. Four, minimize tree vegetation and soil removal and grade changes. Five, maximize open space retention. Six, screen objectionable features from neighboring properties and roadways. Seven, give consideration to the impacts of the project on town services and infrastructure. Um, eight is about um, utilities being underground. Um, <coughs> nine is about exposed storage areas, machinery, uh, you know, being um, set back or screened. Um, number 10, site plan shall show measure, measures to reduce and abate noise. 11, um, site plan shall comply with all zoning requirements for parking, loading, signage, dimensions, environmental performance standards. Um, and 12 is um, that it's, con it's consistent with the objectives of the comprehensive plan. Did anyone in that list have anything that jumped out at them that we should discuss? I mean, I think time? the. Um there, there's a little bit of conversation, so the river's there, and we, we have talked about like other projects, like trying to sort of value that, like we maybe in all the planning along the way, we didn't, right? And so that landscaping along that side, mm -hmm. if that sort of keeps that, that it's at least visible. Um, keeps the river visible? Well, it, I mean. There's a, there's a lot of um, what I would call immature trees, mm -hmm. not saplings, but yeah. you know, they're not old growth trees that are long in there. When the leaves are out, you're probably not going to see that river from that parking lot. Um, it was a little, not impossible, but a little tough mm -hmm. just for me moving around in there getting the survey shots. Um, the arborvitae are, certainly they, they take up space. There are six of them proposed. I don't think they're going to, I mean, these things have got to be spaced 10 to 12 feet apart. I don't think they're going to grow together mm -hmm. to create a hedge. So there will be space in between. But you could say, well, whatever view you have of the river right there, the arborvitae is going to at least block some of it, um, more so this time of year than in the summer. Um, but I guess my question would be, how many people are actually going to be standing on the edge of that parking lot looking at the river? You can't really see it from the street because it drops off pretty good yeah. right in that area in there. Is the question then, do they want to add them at all? Like, we've never had them before. Do we need them? Is well, that trees are good. I mean, I... I think I'm just thrown out like, yeah, the, mo the best use of that. I, yeah. I appreciate that they're trying to improve, yeah. not only bring a service, but trying to improve. Uh, and I would have to check with uh, um, Susan MacArthur on mm -hmm. that to see whether or not those arbor bodies were required as part of some sort of mitigation with okay. conservation. Yeah, trees are good. And then I think um, this is not a requirement, but we've kind of discussed with applicants like trying to activate spaces for the public and including like a bike rack if possible. And, you know, when you mentioned like the picnic tables, that becomes yeah. semi-public space, which would be amazing. Yeah, I, I don't think if, if you wanted a bike rack in there, they've got plenty of room to stick one right over on the side over here. That's a good idea. My, my only other comment was on infrastructure. Is the business going to be frying or cooking something on the premises, or is it just cold cuts? Okay. So there's no problems with grease traps and things like that? I think there is one already. Yeah, I know, but are they going to use it? Is it so there's going to be meats, you know, like, like again, at the new markets, so there, will, there will be meat, but uh, to my knowledge, there won't be any meat. Like fried food or things like that? Yeah, we... The applicant, we did have a tech review meeting. We all checked, we checked in with Board of Health. So the Board of Health is working with the applicant. You know, to get that grease Correct. Trail. Yep. If it's internal, if it's going to be external, what the, uh, obviously what the condition of the external grease strap is okay. for Dairy Queen, um, what would suit the proposed business the best. You yeah. know, at right now, I don't think it's a, a full proposed commercial kitchen is being proposed. Um, but it's just a matter of what would suit the applicant at this time. Okay. But they have met with the Board of Health. Yeah, that, it's, mm -hmm. it's an important thing because the grease trap is there. We know there was one. Correct. But it's been vacant for 12 years or so. Yeah. So it's probably not in great shape. Who knows? I would know. I would, I would assume so. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Just, just quick, their intention is basically the meats, the vegetables, a deli counter, and they're going to sell sandwiches. Someone comes in, I want a ham and cheese. Yeah. 
they just got it. You're not cooking anything. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this um, this is a project that would be uh, sent to the design review committee, or because it is six or more parking spaces. So some of these questions, obviously, with the um, with the landscaping and and things, um, we can we can let them look at as a part of this. Does anyone have any comments from our perspective? Um, and um, I think either something that else we want to talk about as a planning board, and then secondly, anything specifically we want to call out to um, design review in our typical memo that we that we send to them. I would have just three items that they may look in, in, into because of the rendition that we're seeing here. Uh, I don't know if the materiality of the building is going to change. Is that a new siding or, 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 or what is it? It's not clear to me. And the roof seems to be the same roof that it looks kind of the way it looks when you go by there, but it's going to be a, a, a change in the roof. So I assume is, if the roofing is going to be new, what, what material it's going to be, maybe they can look into that. And then, mm -hmm. and thirdly, the signage. Do you want some sort of sketches on what the signs are going to look like? Because my guess is they'll have the one in the building, but over on this corner at the intersection, the sign post with Dairy Queen sign used to be on. I, they're probably going to put one up. I can tell you that the sign exactly. review is going to want to see that. Yeah. So before you go, you should be equipped to show them, them okay. renderings or drawings with the yeah, that what, meets, what's going to be there. That meets the there's their standards um, bylaws from the town, the sign bylaws, so that they would just have to meet that. But I think it's a good question about the materials because it looks like it just looks like the old Dairy Queen, yeah. right? But I think that that roofing might be hard to match it to extend it, you know. I, um, I don't think that's possible. So I don't know if that, that's an architect question, but we can look into it. Yeah, I'm not sure who to address with questions like that. Um, that uh, you know, the, so for the materials, um, especially I think the roof, the siding is pretty easy to. Yeah, the roof is very visible. I mean, yeah, I mean, it looks great. I, I, yeah. When you say it wouldn't have to be that color, is it your preference that it was something a little more subdued? If you ask me? Yeah. Yeah. I would think <laughs> Just so I can give them some guidance on which way to go with this. I think, yeah, I think in my mind it's not a Dairy Queen anymore, and it doesn't need to look like one from now until the end of time. Are you re-roofing? <laughs> yeah. Can you ask them if the architect's intention is to re-roof it? There may be a problem finding the same material that was on that whenever they built that however many decades ago and matching it. Um, from his point of view, he would like to basically put in new roofing. Uh, the whole building? But it would be metal, uh, something more uh, up to date. Okay. The whole, the whole roof? Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> they, they would like something a little less vibrant than what's there now. From, from what you're saying, the, that's obviously just so that it stands out on, on the drawing, but it would be like a dark brown uh, gold on the call. Yeah, I think. So, but this is something when you go to design review, you might want to bring the renderings of what really is going to look like, you know. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's an important. I think that's a, a good point to come up that uh, that that at least this group isn't isn't married to the look of the old Dairy Queen. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah. Anna has her hand up. Oh, sorry. Uh, Anna. She's holding her hand. Hold on, Anna. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Oh, hold on, Anna. I'm, Peter's trying to uh, get his volume to work with the phone. I can try to unmute, but I don't think that works. We, we can hear you now. Oh, okay. You're on. Yep. Um, awesome. I don't know how you're hearing me, whether it's the phone or, or the Zoom. Um, I, I think my, my only thought on this project, I, I think it's great to bring this kind of business into town, and that's really exciting. I think one of the things, part of the comprehensive plan feedback that I've been hearing through meetings in the box is the community wants to see more of these types of businesses to be accessible. So I think that's really exciting for the town. Um, my only comment was to kind of figure out a way to bring more people to this space who may not be car, um, have capacity as far as transportation, like the older population in Ashland or the younger folks who might be, you know, whether it's kids from walking from the high school, et cetera. So if, if possible, if the applicant, obviously we cannot require it, but if the applicant is willing to um, you know, keep thinking about the bike racks or some kind of bus shelter to sort of open up room for future connectivity. Um, since we seem to be moving towards more walkability as a result of the comprehensive plan and more interest in transportation and public transportation. Those were my only comments. All right. Thanks, Anna. I, I don't see a problem with the bike rack. Um, I'm not certain they want to go to the expense of the bus shelter thing. I'm not sure if the bus stops there or how you would get that route changed. Um, and I'm not exactly sure where we put it. And we'd run into the same problem with the flood stuff storage um, and putting something like that up. So the one thing that we can, though, since they really don't need that much parking, is at least maybe put them in touch with MWRTA. So would they would MWRTA be able to pull into their parking lot, right, just to have that planned in slightly. So we know what their bus shelter wants to look like, pull off the street and stuff. That's not happening there. But I think it's worth that conversation and putting them in touch with that. Is it to have them pull in and drop off customers? I don't think that would be a problem. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, we should at least, it's kind of out of our hands, but it's not out of our hands to discuss those things. Yeah. Yeah, so no, nothing built, but an opportunity for people to be dropped off and picked up. Okay. Is that so, And it, if they talk to them, it might be some slight configuration of the parking lot, and they're like, we will make this work. I, I have no idea, but I, I think we'd be remiss not to try. I would think with most of the size of those buses that I've seen, they would be doing the same thing as, as everyone else. I would probably come in here and go out there, um, especially if they, if they were going in this general direction. Pull down Chestnut Street. You don't have as much traffic. Pull in, take a right-hand turn, come in back out on Union, and continue on. Peter, how can we facilitate that conversation or question? Well, I don't even know. If, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to put the applicant in touch with them. Okay. Uh, I just I do not think the MWRA. I think their their route is limited to Pond Street at this point. Um, just just as a note of this conversation. But, but I'm happy to put the applicant in, in you know, in, in touch with the MWRA. They don't, they don't do uh, 135 or anything like that? I, I don't know, or Main Street? I do not believe so. Okay, but maybe if they say we, when we do it, this parking lot works for us, right? Or some small tweak, it's worth, I think, at okay. least asking. Like I said, I don't think the applicant would have any problem if customers were bussed right yeah. to his front door. Okay. All right. Um, so the, it sounds like then that's our list for the design review committee. We'll put together a memo as we usually do, send it to design review committee, and then mm -hmm. they're free to, you know, go that way. Yep. So I was just texting with Alvaro, and, and we'll work with you. And, and obviously, Alan's more with Alvaro and the applicant. And so we'll get you to the design review committee as soon as possible. And then obviously, I think there's a couple items just to kind of uh, come back to. Yeah. Just it, just in hindsight, as review, I'm going to redo this area here to show that we have our flood storage on our own property. There will be some on the town's property too. And that's just so it looks nice with one big area rather than an island of uh, plants over there. We're gonna get rid of the fake fall. That's gonna become part of the uh, 
the crosshatch, no parking area over there. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll ask about the Arbor Vitae um, and, and see if that was a, a requirement through conservation. While you do that, can you take, a, take another pass and see if you can have more proximity with a handicap spot to the door? Um, I can tell you right now that's going to be tough to do. Um, yeah, just, just study it and see. Yeah. I mean, like I said, it, I'll, I'll find out whichever distance is the shortest. I just, my, my thinking was I knew the front door was on this side. They'd be going right at the front door instead of coming around the building. Um, That's fine. From, from this point, anyone coming here would have sight distance looking in both directions. From here, cutting across, the building's going to block if a car is coming around this way. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay, then I think, um, I think we can continue this. Is, is continuing this to so April? next meeting is April 25th. And I think depending on, you know, I just texted Alvaro regarding when the design review committee is going to meet. They typically meet, but we have to advertise. So hopefully we can get a meeting with them fairly quick. And then we can come back here on the 25th. Um, so I'm not, you know, I know Alvaro has been in contact with Alan. Is design review a, um, like a public hearing? Yes. yes. It is. Mm -hmm. So you need us here too. The you no, they're they are. Zoom. They're on Zoom. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. They're on Zoom, 100%. Okay, but they, they would need representatives to. Yeah, they, be would, be <clears throat> they would be discussing uh, materials, signage, plantings, you know, that, that kind of thing. All right, so it's more aesthetics than it is. Yes. Okay, all right. All right. Yeah, um, if there is a, so if there is any information about certain plants were designated for a certain reason, then that would be information that would be useful to uh, them. I'm going to call Susan tomorrow on that. Okay. 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 All right. So we can schedule to come back here on the 25th, and then Alvaro and I will be in contact with Alan and, and obviously Terry and the applicant to get in front of the design review committee, and then come back here to the planning board. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Thank um, you very much. I'll make a motion to continue six Chestnut Street site plan approval to the April 25th planning board meeting. One second. And roll call vote. Deepa Venkatai. Anna. I think that was an aye. Anna Okay. Aye. Marcelo Rona, aye. Catherine Jerzyk, aye. And Trisha Kendall, aye. So thank you. We are excited about someone using that building and um, appreciate the effort that will go into it. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. No. <laughs> we started early because we think we'll have a long night. Actually, well, hopefully we won't. Yeah. Just not that long. So I'll run with Alvaro tomorrow and then we'll talk about it. Okay. Awesome. So since we have a, the other public hearing, well, so our second public hearing is one. Thank you. All right. So our second public hearing is um, 151 Main Street site plan approval application. Peter? Yeah, so I have uh, been in contact with the applicant, John Maldoon, of, um, excuse me, of Clover Road Brewing. And um, I think from the last meeting, I was able to tell you, tell, tell the board that the applicants um, architect that was working for the firm had left and so there's a new applicant on board I can can tell you that the the, the new applicant new I mean architect. excuse me the new architect um, had been in contact with our building commissioner regarding the handicapped parking spots and they were trying to tie down some loose ends um, and talking to John Meldoon today in um, and within an email that you that you'll see email correspondence that kind of came late in the day under tab three um, John preferred to continue tonight to the next meeting. He apologizes for not having new material. Um, however, with that said, um, he does plan to be here at the next meeting and to bring forth the material that the planning board's asked regarding the handicapped parking spot and um, any any changes to the um, to the area and to the front of the building, to the wall. With that said, I know um, with our um, 120 days regarding site plan review uh, that would expire will 
it would expire on May 3rd, I believe. And so therefore, John Muldoon has concurred that we, he's going to extend that um, date of final action out to May 15th. And so that will show, hopefully will give the planning board uh, at least two more meetings. Um, I do have a draft decision uh, for this project that leading up to the next meeting uh, with new information, I would like to circulate that to the board uh, just to get everyone's kind of eyes on it. Um, so we can kind of um, conclude conclude this application. Yeah, I had let, um, I, after our last meeting, um, I kind of made a big to-do list for the, for the planning board. Um, well, kind of things to do between meetings. I shared that with, with Peter and Alvaro and Anna. And one of the things on there is that I did go through the decision that Peter had organized and I filled in well, Peter took a first pass on it, and then I went through um, the criteria, which are just the criteria I just read. The ones for the downtown 9 to 49 Homer um, do not apply for the for the fire station because it's not um, it's not doing it's not using the ADD zoning. It's using base zoning. So only the ones that I just read apply to that project as well. So it's pretty straightforward, and we were going to send them out for this meeting too. But it seems that we we don't have a See, it seemed a little strange to go, th go start going through criteria and stuff when we don't have a, a, a site plan in front of us, right? Mm. I am okay, though, sending it to you guys if you want to read those in advance. Like I said, they're, they're, it's pretty lightweight because of the it's just site plan review. So we'll send those out so that it's in your hands and get this thing. You know, for a small project, it's taken a little long, but I don't I don't think that's in our court. So <laughs> um, we'll get it get it. Uh, through our process as quickly as we can. All right, so we already continued that, right? Yes, we did. We took a vote. Uh, I don't believe no. we took a vote. Not for that. No. Okay. We took a oh, vote. to continue it, right, right. Correct. Continue the other one. Okay, so um, motion to continue. Does that also till April 25th? That would include, yes, to move to May, tw excuse me, to April 25th, correct? So, can we do it? Do we have to do two things, or can I do it in one motion? You can do it in one motion. Okay. I make a motion to continue the uh, site plan review for 151 Main Street till the April 25th planning board meeting, and I make a motion to extend the accept the uh, applicant's request to extend the deadline till May 15th. Second. Well, I'll second that. Okay. And a roll call vote. Deepa Venkatai. Anna Tesmanitsky, aye. Marcelo Rahona, aye. Catherine Jerzyk, aye. And Trisha Kendall, aye. Okay. So we do, so the, um, the public hearing for the MBTA communities is scheduled to begin at eight. We cannot begin that early. So, um, <laughs> Go to the next. even though our biggest fan is here, Mr. Joe Magnani. Um, so why don't we, what else can we take minutes. care of? Let me skip one thing. Minutes. Yeah. yeah. Why don't we take care yeah, of the meeting minutes? That's for February 29th. We did get some in just a few days ago for for that next meeting, but um, we didn't get them in time to really get it, get it out. So it's just the one. Uh, Last, uh, it would be right in front of the one, I guess. Right, yeah. right in front of the one. So on this one, Kate, with clerk clerk's report, they didn't, um, it wasn't on the recording. The recording wasn't, I think, happening at the time when you said how many correspondences you have. So I don't know if you have that number. Um, is this the minutes that we looked at last time and then said to redo a few things? Yes. Yeah, so okay. that this is actually so um, this is actually redone. Um, mostly, it's about um, and and this is something we're going to talk about in a larger context at some point. But I, for one, I think there was other people as well weren't comfortable with so many things being in quotes. To me, that felt like. Now I have to go back to the tape and make sure that's actually what I said um, and confirm it that way and versus saying, yeah, that's the gist of what I said, you know, or what was discussed. 
So this goes through and it takes out the direct quotes and summarizes what was said or what the issue was. I'm pretty sure, because I remembered to check that last time, but I didn't read a note that we, we actually didn't have any. Um, and I think we could probably say that, fill in that we didn't receive any and be okay. adequate, because it will get caught up reported if we did. Yeah. So no correspondence? Right. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Zero. Okay. Yeah. On page three, we seem to have voted twice for 320 Pond Street. We must love that project. Is um, that at right the on top, top? Page three, the first two, three paragraphs. No, the first one is closing the public hearing, and the second one is approving mm -hmm. the application. Do we have? Do we kind of? voted separately is that how it works? Yeah, yeah we have to do yeah, that we did. Okay. because in between there can be discussion usually we're so just dis discussed out by then that we don't have discussion between so that paragraph should have come before the voting then the paragraph in between the two votes no because you close the public hearing and then we can still discuss amongst mm -hmm. ourselves but we can't okay. have any other input okay. from anyone okay. and then we make the motion to approve I don't have any changes. I, I don't have any comments. No. Ready for a motion? Just go ahead. I make a motion to approve the February 29th, 2024 minutes with the updated. Uh, note for the zero received correspondence in the current report. And a second? I'll second. Roll call vote. Deepa Wenge, aye. Anna Chesmanitsky, aye. Marcel Rahona, aye. Catherine Jerzyk, aye. And Trisha Kendall, aye. So those are approved. Um, we have under 15 minutes. We can do the uh, Jake Holberg. To the, to the is that that person's not going to be here, right? We never can the pl planning office update mm -hmm. or the Starbucks that you might have Yeah, that's, yep. that's in here. That's one before, uh, there's one above the minutes. So, why don't we do you want to take care of the Colbert? Is there anything we need to? Oh, sorry. What, so, what, what do we land on? What we're going? What are we going to take care of? We'll do this, the Starbucks letter. Okay. So in this, um, there originally was a small paragraph about the comments that were made. Marcella had made some comments about following the lines of the building. Um, Deepa had made some comments about, actually, I think it could be vertical. And so I think we ended up kind of taking that out. And this was, again, um, Peter wrote it, I edited it, and then sent it to Anna that we thought maybe it's better just to leave it since since we didn't have agreement amongst our committee and that murals may be changed from time to time, that maybe it's best to leave it up to the what would be the cultural council, the artist, and Starbucks, who is always going to be in the loop on this. Um, but uh, obviously, it's, it's a, the letter is from all of us, so it's, um, but that's, that's where, that's where Anna and I landed. Seems fine to me. 
Yeah, it feels like it's better to keep it simple. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. simple. It's okay? So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Then, um, do we need a motion for this? Yes, I think we need a motion to. Well, okay. I'll make a motion to approve the proposed letter for the Starbucks mural as uh, written. And a roll, oh, second. Second that. And a roll call vote. Deepa Langa, aye. Anna Tuspeditsky, aye. Marcelo Hona, aye. Catherine Jerzyk, aye. And Trisha Kendall, aye. So that's taken care of. Ten minutes to go. We still have 10 minutes. We are doing so well, guys. Yeah. Nine minutes, sorry. So okay. Thinking, <laughs> twenty minutes. <laughs> yes, Trish and the board. I, I do have to apologize because I'm I'm traveling um, for a personal trip with some family that I haven't seen in a long time. I, I will have to leave in about just as you guys start um, at eight o'clock. So I apologize for that in advance. Okay. Yep. That's fine. We knew that you wouldn't be able to um, stay for the whole thing. Can we do the updates in between? The uh, what? The planning updates. Do you want to do the updates now, or should we save those for the end? The 1060 main, can that happen? Is that a long discussion? I think we're, we might need more time for the that. The 1060? Yeah. Okay. That's why I'm wondering, can we do the, the review precinct one replacement for the? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, is there any, do we have anything in there for that? Uh, we do not, but I can just kind of set, I'll, okay. I'll kind of update everybody. So when we did, um, so when the comprehensive plan was being formed, um, we received um, a number of uh, applications uh, it can, that can be attested to by Kate and Anna, and we broke everybody down down to the precinct. Um, precinct one, I believe, had six um, applications, and we interviewed. Uh, I think we inter we we asked questions, then we uh, ranked the questions, and then we interviewed. I believe it was the top three. Is that correct, Kate? Um, so Jake Colberth was interviewed. He was the number. He was the number third person. Uh, the number one, uh, the person that was selected overall, um, has resigned from the design. Review, I mean, resigned from the comprehensive plan committee. Um, the second person um, no longer uh, can um, attend the meetings and or uh, could be involved in the process. And so, therefore, Jake Colberth uh, was contacted by our town manager. And he is willing to step forward and to fill the role as a representative uh, from Precinct 1. Uh, and so the select board, to my knowledge, has already uh, put, uh, has already um, made a motion to, to um, uh, place Jake Colberth on the Comprehensive uh, Plan Steering Committee. And uh, if, if we all remember, uh, with, that's when we had those large joint hearings between the planning board and the, and the select board to obviously um, form that committee. And so um, it was a dual joint uh, appointment. And so the planning board is at being asked tonight to make a motion to appoint Jake Colberth to the Comprehensive Steering Committee. Uh, Kate and Anna, I know you were on that committee. Do you have anything else to, to add? Um, no, I do not. Oh, and we lost Anna. So, um, I, I think before we just kind of did the candidates in, in groups and it kind of was previously decided for us, so I think um, it's just uh, making a motion to accept the candidate. I make a motion to accept. Um, Jake Colworth as a precinct one representative to the Comprehensive Plan Steering Committee. Sir? A second. And a roll call vote. Deepa Wengtai. Oh, Anna's not here. Oh, she's here. <laughs> Looks like she's frozen though. Yeah, she might be. Hmm. Not working. Yeah. Anna Tesmanitsky, aye. Okay. Also, I want to aye. Catherine Jerzyk, aye. And Trisha Kendall, I. So that is done. Um, okay, so little items. I think meeting a box is going to take longer than five minutes. I think if anyone needs a break, we'll just take a five minute break. Um, the public hearing is supposed to start at eight. I'm hoping we have. More people popping on. Um, 
And Peter, if we can make sure the slides are ready to go. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I hope it goes well. I'll all talk right. to you all later. Safe travels, Anna. Yeah, why don't we just take a, a five minute recess? Four minutes, five minutes. Just everybody on Zoom will come back at eight o'clock.
All right, so it looks like we are back on, back from a break. It is now 8 o'clock, and we are looking at opening um, our public hearing for the MBTA Community Zoning Bylaw. Um, I see we have one person here. How many people are um, online, just the five? Uh, yeah. Are people coming in? Nobody's coming in, just uh, two people. Okay, do we wait just a couple of minutes and see if we get sure. a flood of people? So we're, those in the audience, we're just waiting a few minutes maybe to hopefully let a few more people in who are looking to attend. We tested the slides. I sat way in back to make sure people would be able to see. <laughs> I was, I was. So I sat way in the back chair to see if the type was big enough. Okay, yep, that's good. So as we wait uh, for people to come in, um, I'm just going to town planner Peter Matchek. I will read the public hearing notice into the record. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 48, Section 5, the Ashland Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Thursday, April 11th, 2024 at 7.15 p.m., this uh, hearing was re was pushed to 8 o'clock um, to allow for um, other business to be attained to. The proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw and to the Ashland, excuse me, on the proposed amendments to the Ashland zoning and Ashland zoning map. The subject matter changes are being proposed for compliance with the multifamily zoning requirements for the MBTA community section, section 3A of the Mass General Law Chapter 40A in specific note noted below. This hearing will be held in person in the Ashton Town Hall section, second floor hearing room, excuse me, second floor select board hearing room in remote particip participation is available via Zoom video conference platform. To join this meeting via Zoom, please see the planning board agenda. The proposed amendments will be on the following sections of the Ashton Zoning Bylaw. A, additions to section 9, 8.9 titled MBTA, community, MBTA Communities Pond Street Multifamily Overlay District. B, amendments to section 9.4.5 titled Procedures for Site Plan Review and Design Review. C, amendments to section 4.8 titled Rail Transit District. D, amendments to section 8.6 titled Wildwood Mixed Use District. E, amendments to the Ashland zoning map as followed. Uh, the Ashland zoning map was posted with the town clerk and was available. Uh, the proposed zoning amendment shall be, excuse me, the, the proposed zoning amendment shall be made to the Ashland zoning map and to the following parcels. Number one, amend zoning map by creating a zoning district, Pond Street mixed, excuse me, Pond Street multifamily overlay district to include the following properties. Zero Pond Street, Sessor's Map, 29, Lot 105. 369 Pond Street, Sessor's Map, 29, Lot 151. To amend the zoning map by creating the, the zoning district, Wildwood Mixed Use, excuse me, Wildwood 
Wildwood Mixed Use Dis Overlay District, MBTA, to include properties 100 Chestnut Street, Ashland, Mass, Assessors Map 20, Lot 271. Proposed zoning amendments in the map permit. The proposed zoning amendments and zoning map amendments are available to the town clerk's office by appointment during regular town, town hall hours and or on Ashland's MBTA community's website through the following link. Parties which should be held on this matter should, should submit comments to the planning board ahead of time and or appear at the time and place indicated above. For more information, please submit comments to Peter Matchek and it'll list my office line and my email address. All right, thank you, Peter. So um, we have a set of slides tonight, um, just as a little introduction for anyone that's online, most people know this. Um, but uh, we formed a working group back in September between the planning board and the select board that consisted of select board member Joel Mignani, myself, Trisha Kendall, town planner Peter Matchek, and um, assistant town planner Alvaro, Alvaro Esparza, who I think is, I think he I saw him online as well. Correct. Um, so um, we've been working since September um, on a, a plan to put forth um, at, uh, at Maytown meeting. And so it has been published, as Peter has said, and um, we're having the public hearings to determine um, if this is uh, indeed something that's, that's good for Ashland. So if we want to, OK, slide one. So I will just be going through. There's a series of. 12 slides, including this one, um, but I, I think we'll go through fairly quickly and then just get to a larger discussion. So, next slide. Perfect. Okay, this is just the review. It's a big review for all of us who have heard it a million times, but these are the requirements that the state has put forth for these MBTA zoning communities. We need to create a zoning district or districts. It can be in a number of places. They have to total at least 50 acres. Um, they have to have a minimum of 20 acres, or we have to have a minimum of 20 acres within 0.5 miles of our train station. The individual areas of zoning, so each district can be no smaller than five acres. Each of those districts has to have um, a minimum density of 15 units an acre. And all districts have to allow multifamily housing with no age restrictions by right. So next, Peter. So that's the basic qualifications we're, we're working with. So and the other, the other component of this, so there's acreage and then there is um, units. So because we are a commuter rail um, community, we have to take our current housing units, which is 7,000. 495 by the 2020 census we need to multiply by that by 15 percent and that gets us to 1124 units of housing none of this housing has to be built um, but we do have to zone for it so it's capable of being built next slide mm -hmm. so the working group the four of us um, these were the priorities as we kind of discussed it over a number of meetings and um, figured out how we should approach this problem. We decided to use what we have, and by that we meant that the Planning Board and um, the Zoning Board of Appeals had already recently approved a number of large housing projects that qualified or nearly qualified for the things that, um, that the MBTA communities were supposed to address, things close to the railway station, housing, um, certain densities and so we decided to use those efforts to help us in our MB to fulfill the MBTA community um, uh, regulations the second was to keep the density as low as we could that's 15 units an acre mandatory but we so we tr wanted to try to keep it that way if we could and then we wanted to respect the ongoing comprehensive plan process the town is in invested a quarter of a million dollars into our comprehensive plan which is supposed to help us determine where we want density where we want housing and to make a number of decisions about our community and so the working group is a group of four and then the planning board and the second group is a bigger group of 10 to 12 to 14 depending on how we want to count ourselves also didn't really want to take didn't want to make big decisions that should be town decisions so um so those were that that's what we started with in starting to look at the areas that we ended up working with. 
So we found ourselves settling on these four zoning districts. There's, sorry, three zoning districts. There's four properties within those three districts. Totaling our total acres is 72.95. Remember, we need a minimum of 50, and we have 72, so we're fine there. Um, so one of those is the rail transit district. That where that's where Cirrus is. One is the Wildwood district, which is where the 100 Chestnut Street project is currently in construction. And the other is Pond Street, which we recently approved a project um, near the residence or right next door to the residence at Valley Farm that has been approved but has, has not started construction. So those are the areas we're working with, and those are the areas where the zoning changes have to take place. All right, and just to look at those in a little bit more detail, the first area is um, it's the smaller of the two, just in the way we labeled things, um, UGC. This is an over 55 community approved for 180 units. Um, this is a project that we've, most people know, it's currently in litigation, and it, it's a friendly 40B. It would be 25% um, affordable. It is not currently in construction. So we'll go through a little bit later. Um, the current density of that whole area is 20 units per acre. Because of the way the zoning is written, the effective density, what it really looks like, or what it really is, is 14 units per acre. We'll explain that in a little bit. And then B is Cirrus Apartments. So there's 398 units currently built there. It has the same thing. It has a current density listed at 20. Um, but an effective density at 14. Again, we'll explain that so that if someone's reading the proposed bylaws, they'll understand what that, what that means. We, we, in both of those areas, we would need to increase the density a little bit because we need it to be at 15. 14 is not good enough to fulfill the MBTA zoning, right? So um, next slide. So the other two areas are... Um, our uh, properties um, outside of that transit district. One again is the Visual Village of the Americas. That's the project currently in construction. Um, it has 174 units. Its current density is 29, and we have put a density of 29 on it. So um, it just uses what we already have. It, there's no incentive for building more units. The other one is 501 Pond Street, that is approved for 125 units, though nothing, construction hasn't started. Um, that is also a 25% affordable project. Um, the current density is 32, and again, we um, left the current density at 32, but noted that this property also includes the residents of Valley Farm next door, because um, 501 Pond Street is only four acres, it has to be five in order to use it. So we've used both of those, both of those acres as a district. All right. So this is the little tricky part. When we get back to, I wanted to explain a little bit about um, when we look at the unit count, and I wanted to explain why um, the units at UCG and um, Cirrus has that. Um, it has one density in the bylaw, and it's it's another density of what it actually is. And that is because written into those, um, those zones, this is for the U UGC Arabella, um, the parcel itself is 38 acres, but there's, some, there's a covenant in place that when that parcel is developed, 20 acres is given back to the town you know, as a gift, basically. We can't count that 20 acres. So even though it looks like 40, we can't count 20 of it because it's a gift to the town. And then in that zoning, there's written in the zoning, it, says exactly where you can find it. In those zones, 30% of it is, is, is set aside for open space. 10%, well, 10% for open space and another 20% for impervious surfaces like parking that you can't build on, right? So that's when, you, while you go up to Cirrus, the buildings are kind of far apart, right? So the density, when you really look at the whole thing up there on those properties, it's zoned for 22, but really it's only buildable it only comes out to 15 units an acre because of all this, because we have to take out 30% of the land saying you can't build on that 30%. So we have to, we have to zone it a little higher. So, um, so that's true both for UCG and Cirrus. and Cirrus, which is the next slide, right? So same, 
same kind of condition except it doesn't have the 20 acres coming out because the covenant is about once the last property is developed which is UCG the town gets the 20 acres okay so that's why the kind of the whole process is a little bit not a little bit a lot more complicated than it first seemed because all of the underlying zoning all of any co any covenant underneath something also needed to be examined all of that had to be reported to the state in order to see if the solution would work so anyway these were unit counts um, if you can go to the next slide basically the number tweaking that we did put us puts us right at the unit count of 1124 units is which is what we're required to do right so tweaking the numbers that's where that's where we got that's good so in other words we we would fully expect this plan to work Alvaro has been through it he's um, talked to the state I think about it kind of pre-submitted it to the state correct so some of the so our bylaws were submitted to the Attorney General's office they've kind of looked at them no red flags yeah um, and so we were we're good to go so this this should uh, this should be acceptable and work fulfilling all regulations of the state it looks at properties that are already built being built or are already approved to be built um, the risks there are some risks in this um, Michael Herbert mentioned it a little bit at the last joint meeting we had and that is that um, even if you the risk is really for the the um, the projects with excessive um, with affordable units that if the underlying zoning if the zoning that they're allowed is the same as what has already been approved with the affordable units someone might say well I'm just going to withdraw mine and re, re um, submit it but without the it would be at 10 percent affordable I think in one case at 12.5 percent affordable but right so um, but they could just submit, submit resubmit it at a lower affordability and it would fit the zoning that we've that we've put on it on the MBTA communities so that's kind of the that's the risk there how much of a risk it is I couldn't possibly say but there's a risk so that that's not a risk of the partials that we have tentatively selected that's a risk anyway if you if you say it's by right I mean we cannot ask for 25 percent so I mean I, I understand and I appreciate it's pointed out because I think that's important but if we just took had nothing to do with areas built because we magically had enough acreage somewhere to meet the 1124 units to zone for we could only require at most 12 and a half percent correct by that, right that's right so it fair to say the risk but it's not quite it it's not quite that simple to say we're not getting 25 if they choose to do it because we would only be able to require 10 or 12 and a half right Right. It, no, I, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I, I'm kind of sick about that those projects could do that, but it, it's, it's not an increased risk of this. We're trying to comply. We're, we're trying to offer our town a way to comply with MBTA zoning by doing this. We're trying to... Um, what we, you, the working group is doing is trying to provide our town a way to vote on complying with MBTA zoning. If you didn't take places where there are potential projects, we could only ask for 10 or 12 and a half right, percent. Right, right. That's Got my it. point. Got so it. the okay. risk is yeah. Yeah. mushed in there and not unimportant, yeah. but it, I don't want people to think that's an extra risk of, because of the parcels you chose per se. No, 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 no. It's just um, we're trying not to, we're not trying to lose what we work so hard to gain. That, that, that's the risk. Okay. So next slide. This is the big one. This is what we call the game changer, <laughs> because just as we were putting these slides together, um, as everybody knows, we got um, a notification from the state that 10 to 60 Maine, which we had intentionally left out of our deliberations for the reasons that I stated before, um, has been submitted to the state as a as um, a 40B project. There was a walkthrough today um, about that. Marcelo and I attended, and. Um, so the question now becomes, do we, uh, happy to obviously to discuss the plan as we have it, but there's no um, incentive that I know of for 
going in May versus versus doing this in November when things are changing. Um, we're wondering, and this has um, been a question that's been asked to me by um, several people, is wondering about if 10 to 60 Maine is going to, is, is at, there's an application in there for a 40B, why wouldn't we use that, that, that acreage as part of what we might do for the MBTA zoning? Right now at 250 units, that's what's being proposed. We don't know if it'll be 250 units, but that is a zoning of 32 units an acre. So even if we put the zoning down there at 15 units an acre, we start to spread out, we start to spread out a little bit more of our risk in other areas. So um, yeah, for the risk that we have, which is maybe the biggest one is at 501. Um, or we decide to take out we decide to take out um, an acreage, like for instance at UGC, maybe we just wouldn't use that acreage at all, right? We wouldn't have it as part of the MBTA communities. We're just wondering if we wanna look at the big picture. So correct me if I'm wrong, a 40B is 25% affordable. So if they go through with the 25, if if the 40B is accepted and goes through, that's 25. If we make this a potential area of the zoning, you can only ask for potentially 10 or 12 and a half percent by the economic thing so that doesn't make sense to me to like I mean the it's I hate to even call that affordable because we know a three thousand dollar a month rent is in my opinion is not affordable so that's a separate issue but how so how the waiting to get us less affordable if you if you zone that for MBTA? I don't understand. We're not expecting that it would be used as MBTA. It's obviously gonna be going forward as a 40B. It's about being, it's, it's, it's our first premise of what we as a group had decided to do, which was use what we have. And now what we have potentially, what it seems like what we have now is different than what we had two weeks ago. But right? that it's is different a, now. That's a very, I mean, that's just, that hasn't even been applied to the town. So I, I mean, I could see you taking the gamble and, and forcing that down to as low as 12, 10 or 12%. Because the fall town meeting would be November ish, and then it might not get accepted till January. But that project, we don't know the cue of the timeline of that project. No, it, I don't think it's so, about that. So anyway, let me, let me just finish. Um, actually, I, th I think. Is that my? Is that our last slide? Yeah, it's the last slide. Okay, last slide. Mm -hmm. So the point is, um, the point we're trying to make is that we were asked to do a job with a certain set of conditions that we knew about in town, and since that time, the conditions are changing, have changed. We don't. There's things that there are things that are yet to play out. Right, and so we as the committee, and I'll just speak my, for myself and let other people speak for themselves. Um, I'm a little wondering personally that I could see why we wanted to bring it to Springtown meeting. But I would rather myself have six more months to see how things play out so that I can then make the best decision for Ashland about how we should structure the MBTA communities. So that's kind of that's kind of where I am on it. So we're looking, I guess, for comments both on that and on the plan as it stands, right? Is it a good plan? Nope, it's better than anything. We should go with it. Um, and, and that's what this public hearing is about. I don't know if, how many, we have now two people in our audience. Welcome, Mark. Um, and I don't know how many are online. Um, but that's that's where we're at. We're on we're on schedule for May. But the in light of the working group, the game has changed a little bit. So, Trisha, do we know like is it a if we wanted to play around with it, like does 1060 main slot in easily for one or the other? Like, do the parameters for yeah. acreage and yes. like is it an easy swap? Okay. Yeah, obviously there's work to be done, yes. right? There's work to be done, but it's not insurmountable. Uh, and yes, yeah, so you could take 60 main, 10 to 60 main, and you it's above the five acres. It's a little bit outside, but we still have plenty of acreage inside the 
the 0.5 mile that's radius from the tra train station. So that's taken care of. So you um, could drop UCG or 501 pond. Correct. You can depress. You can you can you can you you can you can change the numbers around. Yeah. Right. Which also takes some pressure off of the UGC, um, and it could take some pressure that off of that pond street uh, by adding in. Now you can add in as many acres as you want, right? As long as forty percent of the total overall acreage and the total number of units are inside that 0.5 mile radius, and we do we can make it work and we can do so because we have Cirrus, right? Cirrus is a great thing that we have for us, um, and there's so so yes. We can, it's not insurmountable, but at this point, it's too late to, put, to, to do it within the model and within the zoning bylaw to get ready for town meeting to do the whole advertisement. Um, and so that is the situation we're in. We have a plan that we, 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 we hit our goal, right? We hit our goal because we, we came up with a plan that is suitable, that fits the bill, and, and that we think um, can be adopted and or um, accepted by the state. Uh, but at this point, obviously, with things changing, um, six months would give us the ability to continue to study, right, and to continue to learn, and but also to, to rebuild a little bit. And if we were to include 10 to 60 Main Street, we could change the numbers around and or play with the numbers a little bit to... to to kind of force some pressures off of lots that are right now inside the equation. I mean, I I have been on board with the working group's plan for you know weeks. I mean, since you guys started presenting it, um, it made sense, and also liked the idea of going forward at Springtown meeting in order to give ourselves some buffer if we needed the fall. But I do agree with Trisha that this is uh, you know leaving. A potential opportunity on the table that is kind of could be low-hanging fruit for this that minimizes our risk at other properties which we you just talked about the hard work put in to you know do what was best for the town on some of those other lots um, I mean I would be open to reevaluating as things change is is 10 to 60 within the 0.5 miles it's just a it's one, yeah, it's just outside, but um, <laughs> but you can still it, still, it still can count. So I, I mean, from what I know right now, unless we have a timeline, I would not support that because I, I think the danger is that's go, that could go to a buy right 10 or perhaps, I don't think we include that in the study area, but we can maybe say the 12 and a half percent because it, in my experience, I mean, any 40B friendly or not, it was never settled in that time frame. So unless someone can kind of convinced me I think you're driving that project by adding it down a much much lower um, affordability amount so it you can't ask for more than the 10 or 12 and a half percent so if we rezone to include that they are not going to be completed I I can't see how they'd be completed accepted and once they're accepted they have two years to build so they can go back and build 10 percent anyway they can do the same thing that those other parcels can do so I, I, I'm not seeing how that is adding up to make sense. But wouldn't they either have to do the 40B or go forward with our zoning? So like either, yeah. either they go forward with the yeah. lower, uh, lower affordability threshold, but then they're back before us, yeah. which has benefits. And that was just or they go forward right. with the 40B at the 25%, which uh, you get the 25% affordability out of that, but it's a 40B. They get, they're not going to be able to build what they're proposing building in the 40B and also reduce it to 10%. That, that's right. So it's, right. The, it's one or the other. Yeah. Go ahead, Joe. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Joe Mignani, I'm part, I'm part of the committee. Uh, but you're absolutely correct. It, it's, it's, it's one or the other. And, and they don't have, they can't tweak one and then tweak the other to meet their requirements. You folks have that ability to do that. You folks can put them, this is what you need to do during that time frame uh, to get to... Uh, Kate's, uh, some of the concerns Kate has. I have the similar concern, Kate, with, with respect to all this. The one problem that I, that I see is that there is a particular piece of property that we talked about earlier uh, that's, in, that's in land court right now. But the developers that had that property and met with the town, 
they were, they were ready to go. They, they would have been built by now. This has been going on for almost a year and a half, this, this, land, this land battle. Okay, so in, in my mind, we would have had that, that project almost done, almost done. It usually takes two years for this particular project. It's, it's a year and eight months already waiting for this to happen. And thankfully, the builder has faith that this is going to, you know, be part of their, you know, part of their project and for the, for the future. So if this gives us the opportunity to hold off a bit to make sure where this, where this particular uh, land parcel is going to go, uh, then it, that falls directly right into, our, you know, right into our hands with the original design of what we wanted to do. Uh, and that relieves some of that, that pressure of units per, acre, per acreage that we're, that we're concerned about. Because that's one of the things that we all, we're all were in agreement with, is that we didn't want to have it look like some of the pieces of property that are in Framingham, they're so convoluted with buildings on a specific area that they can't breathe because you have building on top of building. And that's not what we want for Ashland. We want to make sure that there is enough acreage for this building for, for these buildings and projects to work, so that way it's you know you don't have to roll out the window and say hey excuse me I need a cup of sugar and just hand hand it back and forth to one another, you know I would use toilet paper but that was kind of gross. However, I just that's that wasn't our vision. Our vision was to make sure that we met the compliance of the MBTA zoning requirements, which is what we have done. But again, this this whole new facet that's coming down the road I it definitely puts it definitely puts things in perspective and I would like to see this play out uh, I'm not one for waiting but at the same token this may be something to wait for and see how it all plays out and uh, again all we we have the plan that's that we feel comfortable with it may even be a better plan once we see where some of these other projects come into play and who knows? It, it may it may be to our advantage that now we have more acreage, and we can s expand that so that way we're not condensing mm -hmm. the the units on on one smaller piece of property. So what's the harm of going to spring town meeting with this? Because you're going to have you've already done the work. You yep. got it. Except we got the lawyer. You if we reevaluate another parcel downtown you're going to have to do that work anyway we could redo that at the fall town meeting if it seems like something potentially would make this better i i don't see why that wouldn't you're doing the work anyway and i know that people have an inordinate amount of work and every every public meeting i saw people recognize that and thanked you and i will add to that thank you right but that work has been done we're ready to go you're going to still do the work to look at that parcel if something comes through and then it can be revisited at fall my worry with that though is then then in order to get any benefit from that it, the benefit to us yeah. including 1060 main would be removing another property where we feel like there's some risk to the town and some risk to the work that's already been done to get conditions that we want for projects and i worry that like including a parcel and then rolling that back at fall town meaning i also worry about like the optics of that with the town to say we just we just did this in the spring now we're going to do it again in the fall and do a switcheroo I, I feel like it's cleaner to have one proposal with that's very well reasoned go to town meeting one time it gives us more time to do public outreach on it and get people sort of understanding and there's also a lot of thoughts on the 1060 project and I think um, I don't know I worry I worry that going forward with what we have and then swapping out I don't I, I don't even know what that would look like trying to remove a property in the fall but like we and if we can't then we lose the benefit of including it's just a it's it's a it's a warrant article it's a vote it's a zone yeah. you know and it's just it's it's part of uh it's part of doing business when you come when it comes to zoning I mean I just worry that it's like a very quick turnaround to well, I, un I understand because I agree anyway. with but to me it's the the risks that we outlined that's exactly the risk those stuff can happen in those six months right so um, that that that's just it. it will it happen I probably not like I have no idea right but it weighs 
on the minds of us on the on the working group it, you know yeah. but and just a no and, and i know we have one hand raised claudia is that we have to be in compliance by december 31st of next year right right and so that's the that's the that's the deadline december 31st of 20 excuse me 24 yeah i'm sorry this upcoming december 30 23rd uh december 31st. 31st i spoke i misspoke uh, so we have one person on, on online with their hand up. I'm going to ask if you, uh, if you, if you may, I, please. Ju just as a general comment, because I was listening to the, the the arguments both ways, and after hearing all that, I think I concur with the description that you that you made, Trisha. It seems like it's a win-win-win. Uh, is really the, the potential to relieve pressure from from sites that would develop the way we want them. Uh, the potential to to improve the affordability using that potential for the project, um, and the ability to do it clean, like like uh, you were saying, um, in in one in one thoughtful run, I think there's more chances that that the town and the town meeting would would appreciate it more holistically and and, and vote it in favor. So, it, that that plan to me makes sense. I'm just having been part of the 1060 design process in the last year and a half, and what we've heard from the town, we were anxious when we even heard 185 units. Now we are saying 250 units, 25% that to the developer is still 185 units that they still get. But what's the advantage of that 250 is your affordability is past that. When they came to us, it was 185 minus the 10%. So from the developer point of view, it, the 40B is a great approach for them. But I, I would be surprised if our town is going to just accept this. So I'm curious, I know we have that as a separate topic, but what exactly is, what happens after this 30 days time period that we have for discussion on 1060, what happens, what is really in our hands, or is that just what comes our way? Because to me, I somehow feel what Kate was, to me that I feel like the work that you've put in for now, yes, there is a bit of risk in that, but it feels like we need the town to react on that. And if you keep that to the fall, it, with the hope that 1060 is going to happen, which I'll be surprised in, like you said, in six months, we are already in April. Um, it would be magic if it to have that clear a direction. You At that time, when you go back to the town with this proposal, and there are kind of a lot of back and forth, you've lost battle in both sides. I think we are asking, calling for more risk, trying to say let's table this plan and wait to see how 1060 develops. I'm not convinced on that myself. It, it's, if, if I may just add an, another point to that. Well, but you can, if you just have a. No, that, let Claudia, because uh, she's had a hand raised. I, yeah. Claudia, I see, Claudia Bennett, I see you with a hand raised. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Good evening. Uh, you know, first of all, I just really want to thank everybody too. I mean, there's a uh, an unbelievable amount of work that goes into almost everything that happens in the town that people don't realize, and uh, certainly uh, we appreciate all the work that this committee, this subcommittee, has put forth uh, to get us to this point. Um, you know, I just want to say, just from a very simplistic uh, point of view, that uh, while I understand that a lot of work has been done. It would be nice to take it forward. I have concerns with then having to try to change it come fall if that ended up being our best um, solution or our best uh, you know, way to proceed come fall. I also feel as though uh, there's a lot on the plate right now for this town in terms of development. And I think we, be, we need to be able to discuss uh, you know, openly all the different things that we're faced with at this point in time. And this is definitely, you know, a part of that picture. 
Um, if indeed it is going to be a 40B project, then I do think that we should get credit for it, if you will. Um, and then the other thing in terms of the 30-day um, talk back, I think for commenting, I think that's been extended. Um, I'm not exactly sure the date of the extension, but we were granted an extension when Michael applied. Uh, so we have some additional time for that. Mm -hmm. However, we I don't think any of us should get too excited about that because from what I understand, um, those the, the, the ability and the opportunity to give c comment um, often do not prove to be fruitful uh, for those who are commenting. Um, so I would I would be in favor of waiting another few months and and have some additional information. Take the time to really have the community be aware of all the things that we're looking at in the community around development, not even just this single um, issue, and and be able to bring it to um, you know an educated uh, public in the fall. Thank you, Claudia. Joe? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I don't disagree with what you're saying. I would just like to add, it's just not 1060 Main Street that, that provides us the concern. It's a, it's a piece of property that we currently have as part of our formula, and that could easily be pulled away. And that's the concern for me, and my, far more than 1060 Main Street, is, to be very honest with you, um, because of the stature of the the project itself and how it would fit very nicely in, the, in this whole area. Uh, and it, if it stays the way it's supposed to stay, and I hope it does, I mean, we're putting a lot of, you know, we're putting a lot of wishful thinking, you know, in land court and hopefully it'll get passed. Like I said, it's been a, a year and, and eight months for this to, this to go through. And, um, you know, there may, be, there may be some light at the end of the tunnel coming this way. Uh, so if we get that extension for six months and we have that vote in the fall, it would be more than likely that we would probably see some decision made on that piece of property. And that would be very helpful for, for us uh, as, this, as this committee to keep that property where it is and not have it, you know, pulled off from underneath us. Uh, and that could easily happen. So if we keep, if we, it's just not... It's just not that one specific, you know, item. And you're right. 1060 is not going to get passed and voted. There's going to be a long discussion and it's going to get done. However, it is a 40B. It's not a friendly 40B. So will it get done sooner than later? Yeah, it will be. It will be. And probably not to our liking. But hopefully you folks can put some, you know, restrictions on what, what can and what can't be done. You know, so you, you've got a lot on your shoulders that's going to be coming up on, on 1060 Main Street. And I... And I don't, uh, I don't envy any of you <laughs> that have to sit down and listen to this and, and try to, you know, and try to corral a monster that's well, loose. A 40B does go, does go to the Zoning Board of Appeals, just for a note, note of clarification. But you I folks mean, can put, you can put, yeah. yes, you can put certain things on there as well. So I think it's, oh, sorry, Kate. I, I was going to say, I think it's important to note that, like, I think the idea of including 1060 isn't rubber stamping the 40B project as a, as approved. It's saying if this is going to be built, as Joe just said, it's, it's going to happen sooner rather than later. It's saying let's leverage it and zone it for, I think we had said 15 units an acre, which is way under the 32 that they're proposing to build. And it just helps us get credit towards what Correct. we need to do for 3A. Yes. So it says we're in this very sticky situation with 40B. Let's get something out of it for MBTA zoning 3A purposes and I think that's an I think it's an important point to be clear about that to the public that it's that including 1060 isn't saying we are super psyched about this project at 1060 Maine it's saying let's get something good for the town out of it and be able to exclude another property from this much more generous zoning for 3a and and leave it out and have a project hopefully be able to proceed as we had planned yes and I think that to me is worth delaying, even though I was, you know, very much in the camp of trying to do everything we could to go to Springtown meeting. Yeah, and just a note from a number standpoint, yes, and the, the 1060 is currently proposed at 250. No one is saying let's go 250, right? We could do by right, we could do zoning that brings it up to 
you know, if you do the minimum 15 units per acre, you're sitting at 112 right then, right? So if you do minimum of 15 units per acre at 112, you can then depress the other, the other pressures, right, across the board on the other properties. The further you, you move that, that 112 up to, say, 150, then the lead, then you can kind of play with the numbers. And so that's what, when I say you can kind of shift things around and shift pressure around, that's what I was alluding to. And it's not to say just a, it's not to say that we have some magic solution in our head here, you know, because we don't, right? We were trying to work hard for this, which is what we were just thrown for a loop to two weeks ago, right? When we had to, you know, just after our last meeting, when we had to say, okay, how does this affect us? So I don't know what the best solution is. Maybe it'd be right back to exactly what we're proposing, but it seems like we should think about it and we should see what happens. Will UCG come out of, lit come out of litigation? Probably not, but maybe it will. Will something happen at 501? Will they go into construction, you know, and they got a building permit away? Maybe not, maybe yes, right? But all that's more information that we use to make the best decision we can for Ashland. And that's what, that's I think what weighs on me, not that we have a bad proposal here, but that now I feel like I'm using incomplete information to make the best proposal I can. Uh, for you know, the community, just but, not, yeah. But so with that, Kate, I have a question. So, because the, this argument makes a lot of sense to me. What would you say, if you can point out, what is the great advantage to the town to ignore that argument and go for the vote on the, in the spring? Because I don't see it yet, if you can I explain mean, it. Well, let's be honest, conditions always change, and we had to get the working group got going knowing that UC, uh, UGC was in land court. We don't know. It, it, Joe seems to indicate there might be some more information, and, and I mean... If that's part of the puzzle, I, I feel a little bit differently, but I'm not sure that we do have more information or if that's going to be built, right? And um, I feel like the the weight does not make sense to me the way you first explained it. Maybe all these pieces together possibly, but I, 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 I'm not, um, definitely not but, convinced. But, but can you help me pointing, what, what is the advantage? Because there is no information. There is a 40B that has been filed on, on, on mass housing. Um, and it will go through, who knows how, but they are intending to go through. We met with them today, the developer is there and they have financing and they're moving through the process. So that's new information. So what would be gaining from not taking it into consideration, just move forward as we had a couple um, of weeks ago? Because there's no way that will be settled by town meeting. So we're back, we will be in the same situation in November. We're just gonna do our best to make decisions. And what would be the difference? If we are back to the same situation, then the vote goes as if I mean, if, one, if one big difference, and I will repeat that, is you now you're putting sort of a uh, everybody over a barrel. You have to pass this because it, it's due by the end of the year. I mean, I guess we could say we'll have another special town meeting if it doesn't fail. But the, the whole point of this was giving people a chance to say, let it fail. We, we aren't speaking for the community, right? We're, we're doing our best to present something, and you're, you're taking an opportunity for the community to speak away. Do you think the community also just learn about these new projects? Would they not take into consideration like like some people in the committee are? Oh, I, I think so, but since it's not going to be settled, I, I fail to see how that's going to change it much. It, it's UCG, it's a 40B. This has always been an issue, things that you don't control. We're just doing our best. We don't control the, that zoning law. We're trying to react to it. So if it was settled, I would agree. I don't think it's going to be settled, and I don't see how that's helpful. I don't know that it needs to be, in my mind, I don't know that 1060 needs to be settled. I think, like, to Joe's point, again, and to Marcelo, it's like, it's going to happen in some way, shape, or form, and it's going to happen at higher density than 15 units an acre. So to me, like, if that's what the way we zone it, whatever ends up being there is going to qualify under the zoning. They'll go forward with the 40B no matter what. I mean, if they choose to go forward under the zoning that we put in place, that's great. Um, and it's, I, I don't see how the incentives work for that, but... I think what we get out of it is using it for this purpose. I don't think it has to be settled. I think it's of all the of all the variables to me that are out there with all these different projects with the unbuilt projects. Ten sixty seems the most certain to become reality. And and, and, and like I, I guess I one agree thing with, there. with that because the because the the process that we went through ten to sixty, which was extensive, and we put a lot of work into it, trying to really 
craft something that was good for downtown. Uh, but uh, the owner of that property has been making an effort for a while now, and now he found his way. Uh, to me, that is, more, that, that is more likely than not. Just in any case, and we have uh, Mark that wants to speak, and I think Elvro maybe, maybe yeah, wanted I just, to speak. But just, uh, I just wanted to say that like this public hearing also is not about taking any vote or coming up with any decision. decision. It's just a discussion tonight, and I would hope that we wrap it up at 9. So, okay. Um, well, I'll let Great. Mark go first, Elvro, and then okay. we can. Okay, thank you. Mark the Sony, 49 Hawthorne Road. Wishing and understanding what's realistic is hurting your decision making right now. The state and this town are on two different odds right now with what to do, how to get away from things, and how to go forward. T today, April 11th, we found out different things came down the pipeline. But our zoning has not changed. Even it's got maybe the MBTA zoning. So what makes the board think if it's going to work for the town, if the state's going to go with what they say and then thinking that the Ashton zoning might change for them? How can this be an agreeable and not worth the time to go over and talk about it and then change in the last second. It's my usual way of saying it, the two-way street. Compromise, understand, so everybody can have an understanding of what's going on and come out together on this. But right now, we're in a pileup of misunderstandings. And waiting six months, it could be everything kumbaya, or it could be a bigger pileup. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Alvaro, I think you had to, uh, we wanted to make a point, pal. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I guess when we were looking at the math as well, if you see the total permitted for UGC was 180, and if you see uh, the total permitted for 501, it was 125, that add, adds up to 305 units. And so we were looking at the fact that those were a higher amount of units than 250 at 160 main. So in some way, we were putting a jeopardy those 300. 305 units uh, while looking at the 250. So that was part another reason why, we, um, or a, another point that we had on our last discussion. So just wanted to add that. Thanks, bud. Um, so I, th I thought that the process was after hearing that the planning board does vote to like say this goes forward, but is that not true? So, it, so it can just either show up on the docket or not? So this has been submitted to the warrant. It's been added to the warrant. So this is the public hearing where the planning board either votes to recommend and to not to recommend, right? And so the planning board can discuss this and then, but what comes out of this, yes, is a, is a vote to either support to recommend and recommend the article at town meeting floor in obviously, or to not support the article as printed in the warrant for reasons listed you know and so um and so i think we don't have to come to a vote tonight you know it's very it's very um new it's new right and it's very common for a planning board to open a public hearing as you know and continue it uh, but we do have to give a recommendation at town meeting floor uh just with the time frame and in, in, in the regarding the state regulations that we were under and so uh I, we have to have one public hearing which is what we're doing right now correct did did we do we put on the calendar a second one or do we have one right now so we have one right now it was advertised and then it can just be continued to the next meeting april 25th which is obviously this, the last meeting before town meeting. Uh, and then the planning board will be asked at town meeting floor to give a recommendation. Um, and either that comes from a vote to either to support and or to not support the article as printed. I feel like one thing that we haven't discussed about a potential upside of delaying and including 1060, and this is the last comment I'll make. I'm sorry for being so vocal on this subject, <laughs> but... Um, I mean, I think that there's been some some public sentiment around like 
are we just evading the purpose of this? Should we really be leaning into the purpose of MBTA communities? And there is like an element of, okay, we don't love that this 40B came in. It's not a friendly 40B. You don't like this, the way that this is designed at 1060. We're not saying we're psyched about it, but it's also 0.6 miles from the train station. And that's probably much more within the, the way that this, that the intent of 3A was designed in MBTA communities is that, you know, people are going to, Maybe just walk up Pleasant Street and, and hop on the train. I mean, I think the optics of that over some of our other lots, you know, if we're thinking particularly if I'm thinking about 501 Pond, that I think is a potential additional benefit of including a project that, while we are not thrilled that it is sort of eligible now for consideration, it is there. I think that's a good point. Very, yeah. So, so the planning board doesn't have to vote on this tonight. I know it's nearing nine o'clock, and we do have the state sustainability coming on committee coming on at nine o'clock. But, um, but we can we can table this matter and just continue it with a motion to uh, April twenty fifth, if appropriate. Can I ask one last question? So, in a scenario where ten sixty happens. At that point, would 501 get off your chart or UGC? Well, that's, those are the types of things like I, you, you know, I don't know what, we, we didn't discuss that. All we discussed is, is this an opportunity or not an opportunity? Like other things besides 10 to 60 can happen in there yeah. that would push one thing, us one way or the other. Push the board, not, not just not to our little committee, the, the 10 of us or the, you know, whatever. So um, I, I don't know. That, that's the big thing. It's a big question mark for me. And that's why I feel less, unfortunately, less confident about it than I felt two weeks ago before we knew about 10 to 60. Yeah, in deeper, so I think the biggest thing is, like, obviously, if it comes in, if, if mm -hmm. when, you, when you add 10 to 60 to the equation, right, 501 Pond Street, right, development, permitted, that permit's live, right? 25% affordability, right? If we understand that a new owner is gonna come in, right? And if we change the MBTA bylaw, I mean, if we adopt the MBT zoning, right? And we say they have to then add, build the affordability component to 12.5%, right? That developer may say, hey, well, yeah. let's go. I'm just gonna re-permit this thing. And that's the risk. Just to paint it right, dead and clear. That's the risk. And so without, and then also the same thing with UGC. That's a 40B. That permit's still live, right, because of litigation. And so that, that, that shot clock hasn't even started to tick yet. A comprehensive permit's a live permit for three years from the date it's filed with the town clerk, right? And so if we rezone the, with the MBTA zoning, that landowner, that new owner, that new de that developer that filed that application could say, you know, we haven't even broke ground on this. Why am I going to do 25%? I have this new avenue. I'm going to go in this direction, right? Yeah. So to, to, to wait the six months to see what happens, we can, we can kind of continue to work with the model, right, and massage the model to a point where you're, you're not eliminating all of the risk but you're at least moving and shifting numbers around to depress the values, right? And so that's, that, is, that is to be clear and honest with you, that's it, right? And so, you, yes, you, you do lose a town meeting to vote on it, but what you do gain is knowledge and further information that you can make the most informed decision for the town of Ashland. Because we could end up in a lose, lose, lose situation where we have 1060, we're not using it, and we have these other two projects that are permitted and live that now have an incentive Sorry. to switch things up and, and do lower affordability than we had wanted. That's Correct. certainly and that how it feels worrisome. That's certainly how I have been feeling lately with the ways the balls are dropping. Lose, yeah. lose, lose Agreed. is how I feel. But I think there's an <laughs> so. opportunity for a win here, and that's what has me landing with. Correct. And, and the win is you, you're going to wait six months. You're going to see what happens, see what happens with 10 to 60 Maine. If they file before, which I predict they will, before fall town meeting, you add them into the equation. You don't increase their densities up to, you, incre you, you build in the model 
at 150 units, right? But you're taking those units and you're adding them to the equation where you can then depress it down in other areas. And, and in theory, that's what we're looking at right now. So like I said, we don't, I, I just want to, because I just did not ask if anyone on, if anyone else, uh, people, a few people did raise their hands online, but if anyone would like to speak, obviously they can do so. Um, so please do it right away though. Now that we're wrapping up, I'm just lost in my thoughts here. Um, but otherwise, we don't need to make that decision today. Everyone can kind of try to really think through the details in the next ten, in the next two weeks. We'll continue it. We'll we'll talk about it again after some reflection, and then and then and then see where we are. But uh, obviously, uh, we put in a lot of work on the working group. There's nothing I would like better than to take something off my to-do list like that. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. But I'm not sure I can right now. So I'm just throwing it out there transparently and honestly, and it's up for us as a group to decide, right? So um, that's kind of where we are. So seeing no hands up there on our screen, if someone meant, wants to make a motion to continue. I'll make a motion to continue the discussion for the MBTA communities. Um, um, by law, change to our meeting on April 25th. Is there a second? Second that. A roll call vote? Deepa Bankett, aye. Marcelo Rana, aye. Catherine Jerzyk, aye. Leanne Trisha Kendall, aye. So I will continue. All right. Before we go off, I just want to make a public thank, uh, just kind of announce a public thank you to Alvaro. Uh, Alvaro is our assistant planner in town, and, and he is the, uh, the heart and soul behind, obviously, MBTA communities and mapping all the GIS work that he does. And so... Uh, so, you know, Alvaro is, is uh, he knows MBTA and I'm sure he wants to get it off too, but <laughs> I just want to, uh, uh, you know, I just want to give him a look uh, at, at the public meeting. Yes, thank you, Alvaro. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Joe. All right, so next on our agenda um, is the sustainability committee discussion of the specialized opt in bylaw. And I believe I saw Ash. Online, yep, right there in the middle. Yep, uh, how, you, how you doing, Ash? I'm going to ask you to unmute, and I will actually make you a co-host. And then also, um, I will also make the gentleman from DOER welcome a co-host. Please unmute. And uh, Ash, the microphone's yours, Thank pal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am going to try and be kind to all of you because you've you've gone through quite a bit today. Uh, Dylan, thank you for joining us. I am going to try and keep my comments as brief as I possibly can. Uh, I want to try and space, save space for any questions you might have. Um, but um, we do have a warrant article coming up. We've, we've talked about this topic before. And uh, the Sustainability Committee will be presenting uh, a warrant article again uh, to adopt the specialized opt-in code. Um, so I wanted to just share a little bit of detail about it uh, with the planning board, and, and hopefully uh, all of you will, will choose to support it uh, at town meeting. Um, so a couple of things that, that, that I'll just quickly kind of put out there. This is probably the four biggest points uh, to think about when we're thinking about the opt-in code. One is it's for new construction. Um, it promotes sustainability, increases energy efficiency, um, there are multiple compliance paths, and it qualifies the town for additional grant opportunities. Um, and and Tricia, I'm I'm going to skip a lot of the the side slides on this. So so, just to kind of ground the planning board and and anyone else who's listening on this, um, this is a reminder that we as a green community already have a stretch code in play, that goes that that's in effect right now, and that gets extended or rather expanded in July 20, uh, July 2024. Um, and uh, as part of that, a lot of the issues that came up when we last considered this issue at town meeting sort of go away in the sense that the stretch code already extends out to um, increase the efficiency requirements, the EV requirements, you know, they, they get incorporated within the stretch code. So they become applicable to the town of Ashland regardless of whether we, we adopt the opt-in stretch code or not. Um, so, so what I'm going to focus on right now is the things that would then apply in addition to the stretch code, you know, uh, if we were to adopt the opt-in code, if, if that makes sense. 
Um, so three things really come into play, right? One is all new buildings must be either fully electric or pre-wired. Um, the opt-in code does have the flexibility to allow buildings to use fossil fuels, but they must be pre-wired to move to electric. And the main reason for that is that when you're building new uh, construction, it's easier to pre-wire in advance and much more expensive to do it after the fact. Second is, if a building is using fossil fuel, it must install on-site solar, but there are exemptions where solar is just not feasible, You know, whether it's due to shading, trees, whatever, at uh, this the site. And then the third point that is in, in that would be indifference. So, so that that be separate from the stretch code would be that new single family. So this is big houses or big multifamily homes. Uh, anything over 4,000 square feet uh, must be certified either as net zero or if it's 12,000 square feet, it must be basically certified as a passive house. Um, sorry. So, so those are the three main things that sort of come into play. Everything else that we've talked about previously really becomes part of the stretch code that that already applies to to the town regardless right so these are the three things that would be in play with the opt-in code only for new construction it does not in any way apply for refurbishments uh, all of that those issues sort of get pushed to the side uh and then um you know again just making re remaking the point right it's it's new construction not modeling Added construction costs. There is now actually a, a great deal of data that's actually come into play uh, since then. Um, there's actually good studies that have been done since to 2021 into 2023, which I can share with you if, if you've got the the appetite for it. That that really show that it's 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 a between a one to four percent increase, um, and and that also gets reduced as you think about incentives and the the, the total life lifetime of the building, and. Uh, Again, the, the code does not ban fossil fuels. There are lots of compliance parts unless it's a very, very large building. And um, the, the biggest thing that's changing, and Dylan's on here, if you've got questions about it, right, that the, the state is now introducing a climate leader program. So so it's, you know, we've been a green community. We've been a leader in the green, green community. We've actually gotten access to grants. I think the last count that I had was around 700K of, of grants that, that the town of Ashland has received as a green community. Uh, but one of the one of the new things as as Green Community Studio, oh, that that the DOER and Dylan and other members of his team are working on is this concept of a climate leader, you know, kind of come into play. If we adopt the opt-in code, we'd start qualifying for it. It's one of the things that qualifies it for qualifies for us. It opens up additional grant opportunities. I think those are still being worked through. But you know, some of the things that they're talking about is things like being able to participate in community um, um, uh, community. Um, Sorry, Dylan, help me here. Um, the... no, uh, yeah, no, Ash is doing really, really well. But uh, for, for and you know, this is a really new thing, so I don't, I don't blame him. So um, climate leaders can help fund community outreach. It can help fund um, feasibility and technical studies and option studies for um, renewable energy projects for municipal facilities. And it can also help fund the actual capital investment part of that to the tune of um, several hundred thousand dollars. We don't have exact numbers, but um, yeah, since we're still through. working it out, but it's going to be um, the same, if not more, than what's being offered from green communities, which is um, 200,000 for energy efficiency or 500 for a, a, a decarbonization project. So we're looking at at least 200 or at least 500,000 with, with climate leaders, depending on the um, depending on the technology that's being... And the kind of project that we're and looking at. the kind at. of project, yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a really robust discussion the other day. We had an open forum. Uh, our open forum today wasn't quite as well attended. We chose to use that as a, as a comprehensive plan meeting in a box uh, for the sustainability committee. But, but on Saturday, we actually had a fairly robust discussion uh, on, on sort of various aspects about, about the opt-in code. So, so if you haven't seen it, you know, it is, it is available on YouTube. We'll send you the link. But, you know, again, I won't drain this topic too much. The main thing was for me to share sort of a lot has changed. The, the, the issues at, in question are, are easier to comprehend. Um, I have 31 communities listed here. I think at this stage we're up to 32, 33 communities that have already adopted the opt-in code. Uh, we've got much better numbers in terms of uh, the actual cost of, of improving this. Uh, I can certainly share those with you. And, uh, you know, again, I, I think we're better educated 
uh, here are some of the numbers for those of you who are interested in it and I'll again send these slides out but you know effectively uh, for the data that's been collected so far since in the last three years so this is super relevant you know and it's it's across sort of the kind of development it includes high rises includes multifamily includes affordable buildings you know by and large 81 percent of the buildings are, are reporting less than one percent construction cost premium when, when you're going towards net zero so that's actually a higher standard than the opt-in code requires um, so I think we've got a pretty credible set of data now supporting it, and and we have a much more simplified code that we need to adopt. Uh, so so I certainly hope that 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 as a community we do adopt it. Um, Ashton's always been sort of on the forefront of of uh, of climate change and, and and adopting stuff like this. Unfortunately, Ashland has recently uh, been the reason why other communities around us hasn't haven't haven't adopted the opt-in code. So so I'm, I'm hoping to correct that record a little bit, and and I'm hoping to to garner your support. A town meeting um, to, to, to adopt the code. I'll pause here. Again, just being respectful of your time and sort of the, the, the amount of energy you might have, I'm happy to take questions. Um, before we get started, thanks, Ash. Um, before we get started, um, Dylan, could you just explain your role at the DOER and, and what you do there and your expertise? Of course. Um, I am the Northeast Regional Coordinator um, within the Green Communities Program within the uh, Department of Energy Resources. The Green Communities uh, Program provides grant funding for municipalities for um, energy efficiency and decarbonization for um, municipal buildings. Um, I work extensively with, um, with Sam Riley here um, on the call um, for, for those kinds of grants, as well as assistance with um, not just the town of Ashland, but um, across the Northeast, any, any municipality that's interested in adopting the, the stretch code, if uh, they want to be a green community, or uh, the specialized stretch code. So since I have um, been in this position in, in October, I've helped rough, um, about um, five or six towns with successfully adopting the specialized stretch code. And Ashland is one of um, 10 um, that I'm helping out this, fall, this spring um in adopting the code so we provide technical assistance and grant funding for municipalities great thank you all right i guess um we'll just open it up to questions and comments from the board this is a uh, something that um it's not a zoning bylaw so it's not something that the planning board has to weigh in on we can we can decide to support or non-support or provide kind of no decision correct me if i'm wrong on any of this peter but i don't we're not obligated to take a stand correct this is a general bylaw so the planning board is not obligated to hold a public hearing we can take a stance on it and obviously we can vote to support it and then we could obviously give that report to town meeting right. and clearly the sustainability committee would love it if you were to support it so, <laughs> that statement. so i just i just have a uh well i'm sure i'll think of more because i've been sure. When I'm not thinking about MBTA communities, I'm thinking about the stretch code and specialized code. Yeah. Which, yes. Um, so I just wanted to clarify, and I, it, this, this, this should be very true. Okay, so in, in the stretch code, and I'm just going to provide an example here. In the stretch code, um, a, certain, a certain area of, would apply to the stretch code. And as soon as you get, say, an, an addition, and it gets over a certain amount of square footage then you have to use the um you know you have to use the full stretch code is there anything in the specialized code anything with additions extensive renovations amount of square footage anything besides nope. brand new ground up construction that fits nope. with that enforces the specialized code no nope. the specialized specialized code only only deals with new construction um, so I made a misstatement at the last town meeting where I actually included that, and, and it was confusing for sure. So, so to your point with that you had made, even in town meeting, it, I, I was myself confused because it, the documentation itself was confusing. But categorically, the opt-in code only applies to new construction, and whatever applies in the stretch code is going to apply to us regardless because we're a green community. But the opt-in code only only applies to new construction. Okay, I'm, and Dylan, you can back me up on this because you've actually been much more into the process than I have. That, that's correct. I have nothing to add. Okay, and that's, I'm, I'm actually glad you brought back up because 
I mean, I'm de I'm reading this stuff all the time and trying to digest it. So I'm glad there's people that are doing it 24 seven, like as a paid job that can help us here as well to answer these questions. My next question is because I think um, on the one hand, you know, on the one hand, there's 4,000 square feet and above, um, and, and what is affected by that, um, which has to be, if, if talking purely single family residents here, and that would have to be um, all electric. Um, and, um, but on, how, on new construction houses that are less than that, like sometimes we talk about little infill houses or trying to make these smaller neighborhoods, those houses of any size are affected by the specialized code as well, right? As far as the solar requirements, as far as the HERS rating, or going passive house, which would have to be over 4,000 square feet would have to be passive house. Is, is that right? Um, Ash, do you want to take that? Because uh, there are a few points that I wanted to... Um... Yeah, so, so I think even with greater than, square, the greater than 4,000, you actually do have a pathway towards mixed fuel. So, so I just want to be clear. But at that stage, they do need to be rated at five zero, which means they basically need to be passive houses. And you they need do to have be the net, net zero. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah. To, to add to that, uh, for any kind of house, no matter what size, and for any kind of multifamily apartment, you can still have gas. Yeah. Um, for a house that's greater than 4,000 square feet, there's also having the gas option. You just need to have enough solar on the rooftop to be net zero. Basically net zero. So you can either be um, a net zero house or you can be a passive house uh, um, for, for a single family. And, and also noting that being a house that it's categorized as mixed fuel, you could be all electric but now you want a gas cooktop or a gas fireplace, and that immediately makes you mixed fuel. Is that correct? That, that's correct. That's Anything, correct. any kind of uh, fossil fuel that's used for um, heating and cooking and hot water would put you in the mixed fuel. The only exception would be um, like, a, like a gas grill, um, like a barbecue grill, or a fossil fuel-based generator, backup generator. Backup. Backup and then, yeah, so, so you can still have backup um, because, like, with a heat pump or something, you can have a backup. But but otherwise, you would be you know, classified as mixed fuel. But but keep in mind, for sure that that you know that that's requiring basically that you then achieve a horse rating of 42. And, and this isn't something I'd normally share in a in a wide forum. But given it's the planning board, right? I I do believe I think Dylan you you were sharing some detail about you know new new construction that hap that's happening and I think um, previously we've talked about it like we typically are achieving achieving that horse rating on new construction anyway is that is that a fair statement for me to make or am I am I being too too expansive in my statement so I'm um, I'm sure the planning board or um, at least the the planning department has has more information. On this, but there are quite a few developments. Like the there's one on, I don't I obviously don't want to give away the exact addresses, but there's a multifamily development on Pond Street, um, in Ashland that um, has achieved uh, for most of their units um, has in the 40s, um, and I think there's another multifamily development elsewhere in in Ashland that um, also has um, has units. Um, within the 40s. So this is happening in Ashland already. Um, so I, it's not a huge, I don't think it is a huge stretch um, Lift, yeah. for, for this town. I just, I just sometimes want to make sure we, we talk about the details Absolutely. Of, of the project and make sure that they're clear to residents as they, as they listen to this. One more thing I wanted to say is that so in, in listening to the costs, and I understand that, you know, on one thing, we're dealing with costs for um, a new build, which is very different than a, than costs for a renovation addition, and which w this wouldn't apply to. But um, but sometimes in, in, in my own work, um, and maybe I should tell you, I'm, 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 all, I'm an architect. I mm -hmm. do mostly single-family homes. But sometimes when I'm looking at those costs that are given... I can see that maybe the overall cost of a project that only a small component was dedicated to bringing it up to this level of construction, but, but what I'm seeing sometimes is that that occurs after the scope of the project has been reduced 
because the whole scope of the project could not be afford could not be afforded anymore, right? So the scope of the project is reduced, and then the then what's added on is a percentage. So I went. So I always have a little bit of question about that because that's what that's what I'm seeing in terms of the stretch code, in in my own work. So that that's all I have for now. Yeah, and, and I think Trish, you're right. Right, the stretch code adds adds. Uh, uh, a level of cost that that's you know whether it's the whether it's the building envelope or or seating and, and at joints and things like that you know uh, or or the type of windows you're using the the thing to 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 keep in mind here is the stretch code expands to these limits for hers rating for example in july 2024 regardless of what we do with the opt-in code right so so those are those are built in uh, and the opt-in code, you know, really starts really focusing on pre-wiring, which actually is cheaper, you know, when you're building a new construction, or solar, unless you just can't do it in, in shaded areas, right? And and so so it really contributes more towards the life cycle cost actually being lower in the long term for for that new construction rather than being higher, and and sort of is a pure benefit for the person who's actually going to own the property. Yeah, I, and in a lot of cases, you know, if it's a low-income family or something like that, this is actually a net benefit to the community and, and to the homeowner rather than, than a detriment, yeah, right? Yeah, because I, the stretch code already built. Yeah, I, I understand yeah. and I, I know all that. Um, the important thing to understand in the real world that, that I work in any minute that I'm not working on MBTA is, is that... Um, is that the, the the future benefit isn't money in my client's pocket right now, right? So that's a cost they have to weigh, right? So that they Absolutely. don't get they don't get a, a voucher to use now because their their house is going to be more energy efficient in the future, and so I'm not saying that affects what this I, I you know I think this is a good you know we want to go this direction, but right. I think it's it's about being very honest about what's happening in Absolutely. in the real world. You know, and I've, I've, I've been on listening sessions with different members of the DOE, DOER where they're listening to feedback from the building community about, about the stretch code, and there's a lot of issues with it. So I'm not saying that's the case here. We're already in stretch code. I'm just being, I'm just trying to offer an honest perspective about the world I'm living in, so... Okay. T totally, and and super real, and and I think on Saturday when when we had Glenn, uh, you know, on on the call as well, he he joined our our open forum. He, he actually raised the same questions to Dylan, and and we had a fairly robust discussion about it. I think you're totally fair on that, right? Uh, that there, there is a cost increment, and and I think we've got to be acknowledging that. Um, again, the the only point I was trying to make was, you know, the the opt-in code is separate from the stretch code. The stretch code applies in July. Uh, regardless of what we do with the opt-in code, right. and that and shouldn't be a reason why we shouldn't work for the opt-in code. Yep. But but I think your point is absolutely valid, Trish. I'm I'm, I'm not disagreeing with it. Understood. Yeah. Well, I, I do have some um, some comments, but I think that was a good start because um, I'm also an architect. I work in really large projects. I'm working on on opt-in stretch code uh, locales at the moment, and 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 I've heard. Um, all, all, all the rosy pictures that typically are sold with this, and where you were going, Tricia, um, the real world is not the academic world of when the codes are written. Mm. The idea that the, that the cost is only one percent, I would not believe it for a second because I've seen it. Um, the 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 cost is not just the direct cost of construction of a project, but the indirect costs are humongous and have doubled for the client uh, because you have to hire a bunch of specialists to do a bunch of calculations, to do a lot of things. So on the one hand, we say in the town, we want affordable housing, we want developers to build things, and then all the new construction of those developers are going to have to be hampered with all this cost. And then uh, Kate was saying for a different topic, like what what is called affordable is not really affordable. It, it's an exercise that I think gets the middle class out of the uh, out of the question because people that want to do something uh, just can't. It's, 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 it's too expensive already with the stretch code. And we hear, so the stretch code is already in place in the town. It's already get, gonna get more stringent in a couple of months. 
we're already on the large projects that we have um, uh, that we have permitted lately have accomplished a lot of what these objectives have. So I struggle to see what the need is to impose a yet more string, stringent code just for to pat ourselves on the back to say, oh, we're so we're so um, a green a green community. I think we already are, and I don't think it's it's necessary. Um, it seems to me like the, the, this type of regulation is, is very top-down and the incentives come with it. It's almost the government trying to force you through bribing you with, uh, with, with applying these things that then you have to deal with the consequences. The, the benefits are in the future in 20-some years for, 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 for the people that go this route and very few people can afford it. Um, the, the, in, in, in general, I don't think the, the, the town needs this. I don't think the town would benefit at all from it. Uh, I think there will be, uh, th 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 there's, there's a group of people in the town that are very persuaded about it and I totally see why. It's very, it's very attractive, how it sounds. I think th uh, uh, for certain cities or towns that have a different tax base and a different level of, uh, of uh, income and commerce, these would be uh, uh, not really a burden because they will already are a magnet for, for economic activity. That's not what Ashland is. Ashland is a very sleepy town and we're trying to, uh, to help it develop um, um, or, uh, orderly and, um, and fairly. And I don't think this is gonna help in, in, in any of those ways. So I, I, I'm working through it. Uh, the consultants that I work with have clients that, that are basically abandoning projects because they simply cannot afford to either, either uh, uh, build to a certain standards and still make money on the project. And, and that, that is, that is the, the consequence. So um, in general terms, I, I will not support this myself. If the, if the board wants to, to support it, that's fine. I will abstain, um, but that's the way, that, that's where I come from. I think that was Marcel. I, I couldn't make out. Uh, is it okay if I respond to you? Oh yes, of course. I mean, I yeah. I, I, I was not um, making an argument. I just giving my opinion. No, no, I, I, and, I, and I appreciate that. I just want to clarify just just a couple of points, right? Uh, because when we talk about the additional cost, we're talking about pre-wiring, and I, when exactly. we talk. But that, that, that was my point, uh, Hash, that, 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 that when, you, when you bring this type of data for the public to hear, like, oh, it's only 1%, it, 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 it lingers as, 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 as something that is different. It, 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 it's fair, Marcelo. I, I, the, the point I was trying to make was with the, again, with the, with the, with the opt-in code, the, the main, main features Again, we're looking at the, the three issues we're looking at, right? It's pre-wiring, on-site solar where it's feasible, and and there are requirements for large buildings. I'm not I'm not trying to escape that those those three issues, right? But but I think it's important to keep the context on those are the three issues, right? Anything that happens with the stretch code, that that's sort of built in, uh, you know. And and so let's talk about what the added cost would be. Right. So, so we're really talking about pre-wiring, and the reality is that it is much cheaper to pre-wire for electric when when you don't have walls up, when when you don't have uh, drywall up, uh, you know, because it is. Is it going to be an extra cost? Absolutely. I'm not. I'm not trying to deny that anyway. But 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 it, it's about pre-wiring, and the the second reality is that the only approach that that we have for achieving any kind of uh, a net zero goal is to move towards electrification of new buildings. And, and new buildings are gonna live, so, so it is new construction, new construction is gonna live for the next you know, 40 to 80 years uh, at minimum. Uh, and if they're not pre-wired, someone's gonna have to open those walls up and put the wiring in at some stage because the 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 concept that we'll continue to use fossil fuels in the long term is in and of itself not sustainable and and the cost of fossil fuels is going up so well yeah what the opt-in code does is basically say hey just take the time when it's the cheapest to do it to do the pre-wiring yeah but and I, where you I, have I, the ability I, to do it do the solar i i i don't think that that works quite well and and you're right of course is is better to 
do anything before you close walls and it's more efficient. Yeah. But projects in this town are already doing it, is my point. All the projects, the large projects of new construction that these were applied to are already doing it. So, so then there should be no issue, right? So there should be no need, right? But there should also be no issue adopting it. But, but the, the, the changing a regulation cannot be just because, oh, maybe worse. Changing a regulation is a solution to a problem, and, and we need to start seeing it that way. And so, the so there are that other the, benefits, though, Marcelo, right? Uh, I talked about the additional that, let, product. Let, let Marcelo the, finish. The idea that, Sorry. that, yeah. the idea that all the buildings in, in, a, in, in, in an imaginary world are going to become net zero is also not feasible. The grids of our country and our cities cannot tolerate everybody having everything electric. That is a fact. In, in, in many cities where, where a higher point of electrification has, has taken place, uh, on, on emerging, there's a reason why the code allows you to have gas for a, for, for a backup generator. Because, because you will need it at some point. So, so, so I think the, the, my point is that just because a, a regulation is, is always much more than it comes the first time around. It's, it's an open door. That's why you should always try to regulate to the, 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 minimum, uh, the minimum level of, 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 of bothering the public as possible to solve a problem. Just because it sounds good and, and people are already doing it, oh yeah, then, then let's put the regulation out. I don't think that's an argument for me. Fair points. Uh, I, I think long term Massachusetts has a plan to increase the the grid capacity. Plenty of studies have been done, you know, and, and again, totally acknowledging that this is a long term change. It's a long term change in response to uh, to a crisis that that is emerging. And, you know, I think it's incumbent on every town, every city, every nation uh, sort of to tackle it, and 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 again, the crisis in in question being climate change, right? Um, and and as a town, we've chosen, we've chosen as a town, to adopt a goal to try and achieve net zero by 2030, which is more by 2040, sorry, which is which is actually more stringent than the than the state itself has chosen to, and if you don't make the steps required to achieve, like just common sense steps required to achieve that goal. Then, then you know, at some level, were we lying when, as a town, we we we, we basically adopted that goal? We, we chose a town meeting to say to stand up and say Ashland as a town is going to achieve 2040, you know, net zero. Um, so every single time that then we bring up sensible solutions, logical solutions that help us move towards that step, yeah, to but move the, towards that goal, you know, the, it, the that, town, that's a decision the town made, right? Yeah, I, but, I didn't but, alone but the make town, that the town decision. Wasn't, the town was not lying to, to saying that, and I know because we had this conversation before. The, sure. 20, the 2040 date was brought out of thin air just to be ahead of, the, of, of what Massachusetts has. It's wishful thinking. That is not negative in, in and of and, itself, but it's not going to happen. The town may desire to happen, but then the implications are going to become apparent on under their own way. Sure. And, and my, my, my statement to you would be that if you don't even take the smallest of steps, which is to me, this is one of the smallest steps we can take, which is in new construction, we take the sensible step of saying pre-wire in, in advance of closing a wall, uh, then, then we'll never achieve it, right? So forget about 2040, forget about 2050, which is, by the way, the state goal, uh, or 2060 or 70 or 80 or 90. If you don't start making some of those steps, we effectively never achieve that goal. Uh, so, so it's a decision I think that the town needs to make. Um, what I'm suggesting to you is, in in terms of making changes in our behavior for one of the largest crises that we face, uh, this is truly a many many step. And if if you have uh, compunctions about about taking even this step, then then let's basically as a town vote to not really care about climate change or not care about 2040. Uh, I think that's not a fair way to put it. And the, the point that we discussed before, that step that you think is important to achieve that is already happening. You don't need to change anything. It's already happening. <laughs> let me so, okay. let, let me ask some. Go ahead, let's, Trish. Let's, yeah. Yeah, let's, yeah, uh, ahead, let Trish. me just ask some questions about the about this, more about the specialized code. You have up the slide up here that talks about uh, multifamily, um, talk to me about strictly commercial. Um, say Ashland, you know, we're 
talking comprehensive plan, say we have a new biomedical, brand new biomedical building going up. It obviously is going to have to adhere to the stretch code as far as energy. It, does it have to have solar panels? If it's all electric, no. If like, what? Go ahead, no. Dylan. Dylan, you had so, your hand up. Yeah. Um, if it's a mixed fuel, it will have to have solar, but there is going to be a rule change um, at some point this year that it's going to require much less solar than uh, would typically be needed for a commercial plant. So let's separate out that biomedical facility for a second and talk about just general commercial like an office okay. or even a municipal building. So it would require um, 0.75 watts per square foot of building area for the largest three areas. For a biomedical building, so a, ho um, a lab or a hospital, those with a uh, very high ventilation um, mechanical right. needs in the rooftop, hmm. that, that requirement is going to be cut by two thirds. So it's going to be uh, 0.25 watts per, per square foot of building area for the largest three floors. So that's, substantially, that's going to substantially cut the solar requirement on the roof space for um, high ventilation needs buildings like like a hospital. Yeah, so it's yeah. still going to require solar, but a lot less than another commercial building. Yes, yeah, so I chose a bad example in saying a biomedical building. Um, so the um, so with with the specialized code, say if I have an office building, yeah. the um, I'm still following when we have specialized code. I'm still following, you know, say the the Teddy requirements for understanding heating and cooling, and um, and uh, if it's all electric, it's not pre-wired. It's just wired, right? Because that's what it would it's, use. It's already electric. The only the only buildings that are pre-wiring are ones that are using mixed fuel, and they'll only be pre-wiring to certain locations because they still obviously have electricity. Um, but those buildings, like an office building, would, if, if it's all electric, it's not putting solar panels on. It's only putting them on if it's mixed fuel. Is that right? If it's mixed fuel, yeah. Okay. If it's a mixed right. fuel um, office building, then it would require solar um, at at the rate that I just mentioned. Okay. I just have one more question, um, I think. Unless this time. it's passive house. And that's, bec and, and, um, that's because Marcelo and I have been talking about this in terms of in terms of some of the buildings he's been working on that have been challenging. <laughs> and so um, I, I just did a little Googling to try to understand what he was saying and, and what I thought I understood about the specialized code. I'm not sure you'll be able to explain this to me. This is really more of a question for Dylan. But I found two different pages of the Cambridge.gov website. And granted, one of them is older, and maybe they didn't have a handle on this at the beginning. But both of them say the specialized code will require builders for both new construction and major renovations to meet high performance standards, prepare buildings for all electric. Why does it say that? Was that a Cambridge mistake? Do you know if Cambridge has That's an extra? That's a Cambridge mistake. It's yeah, Cambridge I, this, was, this was raised to me at some point before. And um, you know what? What I'm actually going to do, I'm going to... I'm going to make a note to reach out to the Cambridge folks so that they maybe can be implement that. Because it is wrong, and I can confirm that's wrong. And, and Trish, I made that mistake too. You made that we, we, we all made that mistake. I mean, Dylan's on the call, and I'll say this to him, and I've said this to him before. The DOER really screwed the pooch when they, when they wrote this out, right? Uh, it was confusing as heck. It's taken us more than a year to, to fully understand the implications of the opt-in code. Uh, and And even then... It's taken us a year for for the stretch code to expand to some of the limits of the opt-in code for us to simplify the 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 conversation around the opt-in code, right? Um, but the reality is, it is what it is. Uh, I think all of us were confused, uh, and now with with the stretch code coming into play, with with July 2024 sort of looming, I, I think the, I think the 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 conversation becomes simpler, right? It, it comes down to these three things, and and I think all of us sort of had levels of confusion. Uh, some less more than 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 others just w one last question because I, I i really don't know and i think it's relevant how does the stretch code uh, how does the law in massachusetts apply for this the the stretch code or the opt-in code for 40b projects i'm going to answer the question 40b 
So, um, I think I got the most of that. It was actually a little bit soft, but um, so 40B projects, anything that's multifamily would follow the multifamily part of the, the code. Like the, the building code is separate from any planning law. So the way that the, just the type of the building dictates what. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm just going to jump in. I'm going to cut you off. I'm sorry. I'm town planner, Peter Matchek. I can answer that question, Marcelo. So the, the, a 40B application can apply for waivers, right? And so say, in, in theory, Cambridge or, or a community in Massachusetts, they adopted the, the, the opt-in stretch code, right, to the highest extent. The developer, right, would apply for a list, would apply for a waiver from that code, which when they revert back to the basic state building code. On the basic energy code. Correct. Okay, so that goes to add to my point. So we, so we have a very confusing code that people are finishing to understand, yet we are gonna try to adopt it. And, and we're going to put all these, um, all these new regulations on new development, mm -hmm. and any 40B project that comes will get a waiver Mm -hmm. not do all these, mm -hmm. not worry about climate change at all, mm -hmm. and we are not going to get any new projects that are not 40B. That's the, out that's the outcome. Until I, it, I think that's a, pretty extreme, that, that's a pretty extreme statement right there because not every project qualifies for 40B. Um, so so I, I, I mean, sure, I mean, you can make that argument, but, but I, think, I, I think that's a little bit, that, that's a little bit extreme. And again, I'll go back to the point that sure, you know, uh, the, the state codes are the state codes. The the, the legislation is the legislation. We we have to operate within the the framework of the legislation that's out there. Um, but you know, um, at least as it results in in new buildings, I think it's incumbent on us to to take the steps needed. And and again, we're talking about these three things, right? Um, if you introduce 40B, sure, they they can apply for waivers. Um, that that that's their right, um, and certainly I hope as a state that we'll close that loophole. But but that's not that's not in debate right now. The, what what's in question right now is do we as a town in, in believe enough in in the need for you know future future proofing our buildings, and, and adopting some sens sensible requirements, requirements which by the way you know as, as you've yourself said, Marcelo, uh, we oftentimes more than meeting uh you know you've, you've you've validated that for me so you know w why not uh take take that step and and then also take advantage of of uh, you know being a climate leader you know take advantage of the benefits that come from it and and more more importantly future proof our buildings so um i want to offer the opportunity for the other three sure. people to say it's been a very technical discussion i know about this and i, I and maybe maybe I'll state first that I'm I'm not um, I'm not where Marcelo is, but I'm I'm not I'm not jumping for joy either, right? Because it's a more it's it's a it's a more it's just not as easy and it's more complex than it looks um, than it looks just to you know go green. It's just it's um, and I believe in that. I, I, you know, as you know, I have taught courses. I've chaired the Sustainability Committee. Um, but I also have a one foot, you know, in my everyday practice. But, I, but I'm not where Marcelo is. I, I'm more, you know, um, that's why, I, to me, I just want, um, I want to make sure the truth and the, the facts are very transparent. Absolutely. Especially, especially for the, those in our community that, maybe building a smaller house or maybe, you know, whatever, so that they understand those things um, and then can, and then can decide for themselves how they want to apply it. So. Absolutely. But Absolutely. Um, yeah. Any other three want to jump in at all? I mean, just, I would like to, I mean, we'll obviously get this and I don't know that I want, if we're voting tonight, I, I'd want to kind of digest more and look, look at it. I, I was not intending that we should have to vote after several deep discussions at 9:30 at yeah. night without having I, I time to yeah. without having time to digest yeah. and and remember that we don't even have to vote we can determine yeah. if we would like to or what we want to do but we don't have to do that tonight 
So. I um I think I absolutely share the concern around um, the triggers for additions and renovations, and I think that was a point that you know we've said it was said at last town meeting. I think that that will be a part a big point of public. Convention. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I can we... barely hear you. So, oh, so maybe if you that. move closer um, to the mic. I, I think, I, I um, you know, any lingering ambiguity around that point is certainly a concern for me, especially if there's thoughts that Cambridge has it up and is enforcing it. That would be, it seems like, enough of a concern that's out there with respect to that. Um, but I also think Marcelo's point on 40B is a good one. I think that, you know, the more restrictions we put in place that make it sort of harder to use our standard procedures, if you can just go 40B and get a waiver, I think that's a worry um, as a board that's facing you know three of these now. Um, the important thing to remember is about a 40B is that once we actually hit our 10%, right, they, we're no longer vulnerable to 40B. It's off the table, of yeah. course. So it's, a, it's, so it's a limited time frame. Of, of course. I think... Um, it's, it, but it's a valid consideration that, like, sort of the more hurdles folks have to jump through, it makes that avenue look um, much more attractive. And I, I would definitely, yeah, I would need a minute to digest it. It seems like a lot happening at once when the stretch isn't even fully live. I, I, I do want to clarify the Cambridge thing. It, it, Categorically, it applies to new construction. We've now spent a lot of time, and, and Dylan, again, is from the DUER. Like, I, I think we can make that statement very clearly. It applies to new construction. There is no confusion about it. There's no there's no debate about it. You know, it, it absolutely applies only to new construction. There is no question about it. Yeah, and I'll also add that uh, 40B developments do have to comply with state building codes. That's in the 40B guidelines. Yes, yeah, so they'll have to apply. They'd have to um, um, they comply, with, comply the with this the base building with code the, with the state building code, which is going to be changing, I think, this year, uh, up being upgraded. Up, so. Upgraded. So, so again, that that brings us back to you know the the limit of what the opt-in code is 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 effectively simplified. So, um, Deepa, a um, lot to think about here, especially after hearing the pros and cons from the two of you. But I'm curious, there were. Um, Ashwini did say there were like 31 communities out there who opted 34. for this. Um, to going back to what Trisha was saying, we have a lot of single family homes and justifying that cost to what Marcelo was saying. Do we have data to show that this opting this? is the right way for Ashland? Is there comparative studies that we could have pulled out from the communities that you have on that screen? Yes. So, so and, and I'm happy to share. Here, obviously, I'm trying to put a slide together, right? So it's, it's brief on purpose. But, you know, Build Environment Plus it has been collecting data from 2021 to 2023 uh, across all net zero buildings. So this is higher than the, the, the uh, opt-in code requires, right? Uh, because opt-in code does have the flexibility of mixed use, especially for smaller buildings. And... Uh, that that's been a pretty active process, even beyond what the uh, DUER has been doing, right? And uh, so the, the graph that you see on the slide really reflects sort of their collected data, and, and I'm happy to share the study with you. Um, and of the, of the about 30 million square feet of net zero building, net zero ready building that was completed in, in, in Massachusetts in the last three years, and that includes, you know, everything. Um, 7 million reported their cost data. So 7 million gross square feet reported their cost data, and 81% of them basically had 1% construction cost premium. Um, that's just fact. That That's not made up. You know, um, I, I can, again, share back that study with you. So, you know, I chose to be more conservative in my slide because, you know, I'm, one, not a building professional, and I wasn't associated with building and envi built environment plus i'm interested in what ashland's impact would be i i went with the zero to four percent the one to four percent sorry uh, but 81 percent of net zero buildings built in ashland that have reported cost data are in that one percent range and that's consistent across all building types right so so again i'll share the study with you um whether you you, you trust the study or not you know that that's due diligence you'll have to do 
Um, but I think that's about the most credible study that I've seen. Uh, that's most recent. That's not made up. It's not projected. It's, it's actually based on real built infrastructure today. Not, not from four years back when, when costs were different, not from five years back, but from 2021 to 2023. Okay, so if there's no more questions from the board, I think we'll need to, I yeah. think we'll need to wrap this up for the for the this evening. And um, obviously, we know how to contact you, Ash. I absolutely. And Trish, what I'll do is I'll take the the the, the five or seven slides that I did did share with you guys, the the links that I've talked about, including on this mm -hmm. slide, and I'll I'll share that back with Peter and yourself, and and maybe you can you can circulate that with the board so that they yes, can ab absolutely. review it and digest and it. Yeah. I appreciate you coming. I appreciate you being organized Absolutely. about it, and I appreciate you bringing your your backup DOER team. So that's that's great. So I it, appreciate you. You being asked here. me very difficult questions last time, Trish. I wasn't I wasn't ready to answer all of them. So I, I figured asked, I'd be I, <laughs> I asked the hard questions because I can't figure it out myself, I right? I, which is why we brought Dylan, and, and Dylan answered Glenn's questions on on Saturday as well, and, and Glenn acknowledged for the first time that he'd got good answers. So I figured I'd repeat the process. I'm going to start walking around with someone that can answer all the hard questions. That's a good idea. There you go. There you go. There right. you go. There so thank you. you. Thank right. you for coming. Thank you. All thank right. You no, absolutely. And, and it was a pleasure. And, and again, you know, uh, we, we're trying to do the right thing for Ashland, right? I think we're all aligned on the, on the right goal. Absolutely. Uh, Understood. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take thank care. You. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Oh, boy. Okay. So I think. Well, the rest of it is just kind of just kind of us. We want we had a couple sections from meeting in the box. I think we should try to finish those, even if some people can't stay, even if there's just a couple people. I think we should try to wrap them up. I know you have a big deadline tomorrow, Marcella. Um, so why don't we have that last? And those of us that can stay, you could always write in your answers. You could always send your answers directly to Kate, and she could write them. You know, um, but I know you are you are under big deadline. So the things we just wanted to. Um, do uh, is j uh, um, the 10 to 60 Main Street discussion is just about um, it's just about a process. It's not about discussing anything today, but I wanted to share that. Well, Marcella and I went on the walk through this morning. Um, we can talk about that a little bit. I also want to share that Marcello and Alvaro and I, oh, earlier in the week, met with John um, Trefeldin. Not Marcello. Oh, me. What did, I, what did I say? You said that I met with you guys, but not who was Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. Alvaro. <laughs> Alvaro. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> like, you have time for that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm going. The town can be a bill. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm losing it. So, yeah. So, anyway. Peter. Peter this guy. <laughs> Alvaro. The one that was up on the screen. <laughs> and I. Um met with John Trefellen, Trefellen? Trefellen. Trefellen. Tre John Trefellen, um, who is the chair of the ZBA. He was also on the walkthrough this morning. And, um, and we met with him. I, I had asked to meet with him to understand, um, actually bef to start to understand if we, can have a, if we can have a meeting to understand what the ZBA does and how they work and what the planning board does and how they work not to talk about specific 40B projects, to talk about process, because um, John, and I, I think rightly so, thinks that would, that's not the way his board should approach having these projects in, to be having separate meetings with different boards, except about process, so that we can understand. I mean, they have a three-person board. We have a five-person board. They have to be apparently unanimous. We don't, right? So there's different ways that it operates, but I think it would be good to establish that relationship and understanding 40 B's or no 40 B's, you know, it's just kind of the timing of the thing. So we, we talked about that a little bit. He actually already last week, I think met and went with the design review committee. I think he knows Kathy and the design review committee and Kathy asked them to talk to the design review committee. So they're a little bit ahead of us on this one. Um, but that'll happen after, after town meeting. It's not about us, putting our comments in or anything like that. The schedule, um, what, I'm, what I have on the schedule, Peter and I talked about on the schedule again, and so now our 25th meeting is kind of getting kind of loaded, but for us to talk about what comments we want to put forward um, for, for 10 to 60 Main Street. 
Right. So we're going to put that on the agenda for 10 to 25. We could we could send comments even in advance to Peter so we have a document to look at if we wanted. Maybe that would be That's the more correct, 100%. efficient way to do it. Like send in comments. We can all have something to look at. We can add to it so we that we really start that we're not relying solely on one on night. two weeks one on one night yeah right. just on one night really you know one night just to make comments and address it so i think it's a matter of compiling the comments a comment letter is going to have to be submitted to, to you know the town manager's office you know you know michael and and obviously I'll, i'm here to help michael in any capacity draft a letter and for the select so board say, say that again so so we're, we're going to start with some with, with something and, and reply or maybe each one of us is going to well, they, I think if you need to have thoughts, right, you can put them in writing to me. To yep, and I'll print them out and I'll compile a Word document and then I can send them out leading up to the next meeting so everyone can at least read what people's oh. views are. And then at the meeting, we can come together and kind of maybe outline, you know, items that we would like to, you know, create, a, you know, create comments on. So I think in, because you had said you'll send out an email saying, hey, give to, as a reminder to kind of provide responses. Yeah, to I can uh, tomorrow. I can I can resend I, that link. But I think as part of that, maybe we should include at the site walk today, the um, the mep representative from Mass Housing said that there are seven points, for lack of a bit, that that Mass Housing considers in looking at an application. Now some of them are financing. You know, are like, but. She certainly, I think, I mean, it was a brief comment, but it, I think she certainly gave the impression that, like our criteria or whatever, it has to fit into the description. Yeah, it's not a free for all. It's not a free for all. That's stuff. that's right. Of the party, it has to be that. That's right. So, so, but she's going to send it back, right? It, it's. I think it's out there. It's not like a. Yeah. So I mean. I'll I'll try to a, dig it out. Yeah, tomorrow. it's a list. She said. Yeah. I believe she said seven. So if we have that in the email, people will be able to say, okay, I can't say a thing about financing, right? I don't know what the financing is, but it says this, and I'll respond to that. So that's really. That makes sense. I, you can say anything you want, but so you understand what they might have actually to listen to so is it possible maybe um i know that there's a push to get a lot of public comment in on that link like those seven is it possible to sort of let the public know that like when you're making comments you know saying that this is you know huge and gigantic and going to strain the school system probably isn't going to work for the state but if you want to fit your comments into these seven things that the state can consider that is because I think that there's a push out there to get people to comment, and that's great. But it's not. I don't want everyone's comments to be sort of fall on deaf ears because it doesn't fall into the parameters. Yeah, I mean, if if we can somehow put that on the um, on the website, um, we can mass I, housing criteria, something that really makes it clear about direct agree. your comments to these criteria that mass housing like does have con consideration, consideration over. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I'll work with I'll I'll reach out to the town manager's office tomorrow and I'll make that I'll I'll bring this up as a point. Well, I create a form that gives you those seven options on mm -hmm. and not more. That would be awesome. Well, I think also I mean I'm not sure where this overlaps with with the process, but I mean we need to expel out the whole public process, right? Like how are those they're collected? There was a form, but like what happens and Right? Are we just stapling them all in a binder and submitting them, or someone like I don't know? Hold, hold, right? Hold on, but but the way I understood from Michael's yeah. email, he wants comments from the boards. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we will receive those comments, but we will have to filter them, and then condense them to some comments that we send as the board to be included in that documentation. It's not that everybody's going to comment; everything's going to go there. That just the not going to work. No, well, he's collecting comments. He is collecting public comments, but since, I, I mean, we, I get calls about it. You, people, like, I want to be able to explain to, if someone asks me for something, like, what is happening with the process, which isn't entirely 
up to us, but like we we should know that. What is the public process, right? How does our stuff fit into that full process? And I think also there needs to be like there's not a lot of context for those comments right now. Like there we got some drawings, but like I didn't get anything from you know, I don't know if anyone's gonna put a memo of the site visit and then I was surprised to see in the application on 130 that there was a meeting with someone in town. There was never, I haven't seen any documentation about that. So like all that stuff filters a context of what we're looking at. Like the, the more information, the better, right? And everything should be public. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, the exact process, um, there was supposed to be a document about that too. I have not read it, like about the 40B process. It's, it's spelled out, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. that should be distributed. It should be posted online. It's something we should go through at our next meeting mm -hmm. so that we are like, okay, this is going to happen first. This is going to happen second. This is, how, this is how it works, right? And then, yes, there's our comments and whatever comments we're collecting that come through us that maybe we can ask Michael more about. What does the final thing look like that he submits? Is it mm -hmm. a stack of letters, one from each board, or does he have to take the stack Probably of levers not. and yeah, squish it? squish it into one document one that document. he's allowed to submit like i don't know exactly. right exactly but, but we need to know that yeah and then we'll, we would know better how to write a fancy letter or just give a bunch of bullet points mm -hmm. right like which is it you know kind of thing so that's the information we need to have a productive discussion okay. next um next week and i you know i guess it's uh you know i um you know, maybe we can note i'm a little hesitant to we can open it up to the public. We probably get a probably get a lot of people. I'm not sure, <laughs> right? But no. Mark's gonna. This topic may generate a lot of. Yeah, but I also want to make sure we, as a board, that that we're dealing with it for a year and yeah. know the ins and outs of that site probably more than anybody in town. Um, that we have an opportunity to make sure we, the, the five six of us have a chance to have our our voices in there. Not to exclude voices, but I want to make sure we each have a chance to talk about the things we, that are important to us after a year-long discussion, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah, you can only write it's too big one time, right, and that's enough. Kind this of doesn't sound like a planning board night topic. It feels yeah. like it needs a separate, a separate dedicated, yeah. unfortunate time that if we are really going to be diligent enough to read all the public comments, assuming this is going to trigger a hell lot of comments, that's going to be a lot of time consuming work. Well then all I can do is say we can put, I can put out a, what, one of those doodle polls or we can put out one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess the first thing is people are, I'm, we can put out an email with the, as well saying what nights in the next three weeks or whatever, can you not do it? And then maybe we'll see what we have in common. Usually it's like the Thursday we don't meet, but can't do it next Thursday because that's comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. And I mean, their meetings are shorter, so I guess we could pig piggyback a Zoom on, like an hour long Zoom or something. So it's possible, but usually, so, so the first thing would be, I think, to send out a thing saying, here's three weeks. When can you not meet between the hours of six and ten what nights can't you meet you know and then we'll see what's left because it's really hard to schedule yeah. as you guys know really so hard. i also think we have to find out like technically the where we are in the process is under the control of the select board and are they planning on doing a public forum which i don't uh, if they are then we i thought michael mentioned something correct it was like at a select board meeting, which I, I adamantly told the people, Claudia's listening, that I don't think that's adequate for this situation. I think it needs to be a separate forum. Yeah, I think there's going to be. Okay, that, but that's, that was my understanding, but that's not how they left the last select board meeting, but there might have been conversations. So if there's a public forum, right, that planning board can go or not, I think that might shift somewhat what you're talking about. And, and I fully support of like we have, I think it needs to be separate. One yeah, way or well, another. just to have enough time. Like I said, with the caveat that it's incredibly hard to get six, seven, eight people together, and so let's, you know, let's put that out there. And so we will see. We will try our best. 
I'm not opposed to the select board handling their own issues the way they went to. So that I don't, what they schedule is up to them. I don't think we need to direct their stuff, but we can decide what we want to do with our stuff. So, um, so anyway, that's the, that's, that's all I wanted to discuss tonight. Um, the meeting I thought today, the walkthrough basically consisted of walking around the building and then the whole thing was about an hour and 20 minutes and then we we went in very briefly not ever, not everyone even went in if you've seen the building on the inside they did take questions the the team the um so gordon was there um the developer uh what's their name uh, uh being the svl uh svl Ashland. yeah so i guess it's a the, jeffrey engler is the uh principal yeah um, and then um the engineer whose name bowler Bowler was the engineer. And then the engineer, the architecture, um, Embark. Embark, Embark was there. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they were. Yeah, I happen to get working for Malachi. The architect. So, um, yeah, so I thought they were. Yeah, my personal impression was not knowing any of them was that. They've done a lot of these. They understand the process. They seemed um, open to listening. They were acknowledged that it's an expensive site. I think we all know that, right, with the with all the mitigation issues and the um, you know, it, it's just it's not a it's not an open field, you know. So um, you know, they talked a little bit about that. They I think some of the things they talked about. Um, as far as public spaces and um, relating to the community, it, the, the importance of the site, you know, they they voiced those, you know, if you know how much you want to take it with a grain of salt, you can. But it, I thought it, I thought it could have been a lot worse. I guess was the way I came away from it. Actually, the developer opened this statement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. That, so um then uh they also um this is at the end, I think you had already left Marcelo, they talked about um that it's a bit of an unusual project because um commercial is not usually a part of forty Bs. Um and that's by by the state. They said the commercial can be included but it has to be ancillary to the housing um, which I thought was interesting so it almost seemed like their the architect the architect anyway seemed uh, kind of interested in it because maybe it's a little different because it has a commercial component as well um, was my impression so um, yeah and then it was just basically a tour of the site trying to understand how far back from the where how far back the building is sitting and things like that so, not a lot of detail. Please. I'm go. Yeah. yeah. No you. worries. All right. <laughs> um, anyone have any questions like can answer about the walkthrough? There wasn't, wasn't, wasn't tons of notes, right, good to say, but, but there was representatives there from the Historical Commission, Planning Board, Select Board, Conservation, um, uh, there was three members of the conservation. There was members of the conservation commission there. John Trefethen, zoning board of Doug appeals. Doug Scott was there. Building commissioner was there. I was there. Conservation agent was there. Town planner, assistant town planner. Yep. Jen yeah. Ball, assistant town manager. Michael Herbert, town manager. Um, it, was, it was a fairly well attended group. Yeah. There was two folks from Mass Housing, um, and it was a, you know, it was a site visit. Obviously, it was run by Mass Housing. Um, it was their meeting along with the developer. However, Embark, the gentleman from Embark, the architect, and obviously the civil engineer uh, did kind of comment on their plans, kind of as, as everyone kind of walked the perimeter of the building. So, Is anyone, is mass housing or is anyone from Ashland putting a memo that can be made public? I feel like the more everything should be public about this or else people just feel like they don't have any say and that's not true 
they do have a say. We can probably put together, it'd be a very few notes because I didn't take notes. Oh, I, I took, a, I probably took 10 notes. But I mean, between random, everyone you're right? saying was there, town manager, assistant yeah. town manager, conservation. Just who was like, there, basically what we did, I, what was. I think public should know. And I, I think the more transparent, the better. Right? I, so. I think it's fairly easy to do. Just don't, like I said, don't ex expect a whole detailed list of what was, you know. There's one person, I, uh, there's a couple of people I couldn't identify, but Peter might be able to, might be able to know, so. All right, so we will, we will do that. We can work on that. Excuse me? I mean, they, no one did like a sign-in sheet. Usually they do and those kind of Mass, things. I didn't get one. No, Mass huh. Housing, it was, okay. like again, there was ma it was Mass Housing's meeting. It was not I mean, organized should we contact the them and ask for any notes from them? I didn't, they weren't taking any notes. They were going on a tour. I didn't see them take any notes. Yeah. Nope. One of them was pushing a stroller with a baby in it. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one, yeah, but they weren't. Do we yeah. have a timeline of when we are getting those seven point decision making checklist? Do you have like a timeline? Do you know? Is it available online? Yeah, maybe? it's it's their it's their standard. It's like looking up our bylaws. Okay. Yeah. We, so I'm gonna try to research yeah. it. I'll try to research it tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, I think with a very limited time, not only for this whole process, but also members, I think we have to chalk out a game plan just so that we don't land up pointing fingers and not being efficient and really make sure that the public can weigh in and we as a board have time to go through that and if you're nominating one person or two to gather, it's a lot of work in the limited time. So I think we have to come up with a game plan. Yeah, quickly. so I would say, I mean, Peter and I already have, like, I have a, 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 a to-do list from this meeting, so I would say, <laughs> if you guys are saying, hey, where's that email, make sure you guys say, hey, remember you're going to send us this email because, yeah, it's a long to-do list. So yeah. I'll put that on you guys to remind us if, if we don't get right back to you that, that you were going to send this out and maybe it got lost in the shuffle. So. Yeah, we'll try to dig that out and just regarding like 40B, I think uh, I know tomorrow and, you know, we're, we're looking to add information and, and take, you know, add links. And we do have a couple of towns that have built up some, you know, a, a fairly good a library with links mm -hmm. about 40Bs. And so hopefully we'll, we'll get that up and running, you know, and. Um, Mm -hmm. No, I understand. So while we're on 40Bs, why don't we, we, we missing members, but I still think we should have it out there about the, the other. Yeah, so, you know, further than obviously the 1060 Main Street, we did receive another email that there is another 40B that is poised to apply for mass housing. And so, um, you know, just to kind of give everyone the heads up that there could be another, you know, possible second 40B coming down the line. Um, right now, we are at 5.62% in our subsidized housing inventory, so we are open, right? And uh, and so, uh, just to kind of put that on everyone's radar, you know, um, you know, it, had, it really came came from a development company. Uh, it did not come from Mass Housing and or any other state agency that could issue a a letter. However, you know, it it is. It is kind of, uh, we were emailed um, and did receive notice through our town clerk's office that um, a second 40B could be filed um, within, day, within days, weeks, whatever. We don't know what that is, um, but that is the situation that we're in. I where where is that? Union Street? Where's the parcel? It would be along uh, Waverly Street and East Union Street. I thought when we started this MBTA topic, we said there are no more parcels out there <laughs> to have a large project. And hey, let's look at what we have. But that nope, doesn't this sound like there's few. Yeah, there's a few. You know, there's not too many. There's no. There's not too many easy parcels. Yeah. But there's a few. Joe mentioned a, a second one, which would be a third. What? Nope, that's what. Oh. He said there were two more. That's the one that we have, were alerted of. Yeah. Uh, there's another parcel that um, that we have not received any communication on regarding yeah. A40B, but I think you know, um, it's it's on folks' radar. Yeah. 
and that would be in the posture corridor. So, okay, Thank so um, that's that. I also wanted to just, um, if there's any updates, and then we're going to go to meeting in a box. Um, I just wanted to make one update on here that's not on this list is yep. that um, because we all received an email regarding Toll Pond Street and the Pocket Park. Um, so actually, after Charlie Zamuto, what? I think I have to recuse myself anything of Pond Street, so I'll just go. I, it's okay. Th they were pretty particular at the state about that, so I'll just okay. go get a drink of water. All right. Well, I'll just tell you then that. Um, uh, so you got that email about. Uh, yeah. But I had already commented to Anna at the time that um, that. Uh, that I think there was something about a pocket park, but I can't remember if we used that term. I was, you know, I was, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at it because I didn't remember. I did go back and look at it the very next morning. It does say in the conditions it uses the term pocket park in quotes. I looked at the drawings. It's not a. It's kind of they're kind of paved areas with vegetations around and some benches. It's not like this big park or anything, right? We're, so I don't want to put the wrong idea in people's heads. But I did talk to, so that was, we had the meeting Thursday. On Friday morning, I talked to Peter about that and asked him to reach out to Charlie Zamuto about this. And Which you I did. I, take, I took the orders. And uh, no, <laughs> no, I did reach out to Charlie early this week. Uh, I was following up after, well, actually, yeah, after I filed the decision, obviously I sent it out. They have it. Uh, they know about the, the, the 9 to 49. But I did have a conversation with him regarding 12 Pond Street and to set up a meeting to obviously finish off that project. The state's going up. The state will be in that area to finish off the sidewalks. And, and I did bring I will and I did bring that up as a point. And hopefully within the coming weeks I can kinda set up a meeting to go out to the site and, and meet with Charlie to kind of, you know, finish up that project. Uh and, and hopefully uh for him as well, because I think everyone would love to see some some commercial entity move into those spaces in the in the basement for it. Well, it, the the pocket. I mean, again, pocket park is. Is that the outdoor seating that was? Yeah, there? it's yeah. like a cafe. Yeah, I remember like there's like there's these little Feature paved areas on the left hand side of the building. Correct. Yeah, with some vegetation and a few benches, and we called it a pocket. Did we call it pocket it's, park? It's in it's in the decision that says pocket park. But I, like I said, I think relative to the one, even nine to forty nine with the pergola and the painting, it's. You want to be kind of careful. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. maybe that's why we put quotes around it. But anyway, um, we did want to go back and say, look, this is what we approved, and this is what's in the drawing, and we have to have this. So Peter is talking to, has, has already talked to Charlie about that long before getting the email, and so it was in process. So just waiting for our meeting to distribute that information. So anyway, I just wanted to let you, that's just that update. Thank you for so. closing the loop on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and other than that, I don't have any updates that I feel are need to be shared. Yeah, today. I just have one new application, uh, the Joanne Drive, the apartment complex. They're trying to, they're going to come and try to put solar, a solar canopy or solar array over their parking lot, oh. uh, similar to what the high school has, um, and so that is. Nope. Yeah, so okay. that's just a new application that we'll see in the planning board process. Okay, other than that, I think we have everything's off the agenda unless Kate has something she wanted to report on that. Any other reports? Uh, um, no, I'll just do a plug to do meeting in a box. Hopefully everybody gets to do it with their neighborhood, their family, something. It would help and encourage everybody because the public, this phase of public comment, the very important, is ending April 26th. I did do it with CPC, but I, that was two days ago, and I have yet to submit the this, this stuff. I have to read write my messy writing I did one last night and it was very it was it was a good it was a good time so. all right so I think that leaves us with meeting in a box how many sections did we have left? oh this will be it's actually pretty easy because we have two but one I think uh, when I, I typed I I'm up to date typing and it sort of overlaps with stuff we've we've done so uh, activity six ways to play in an experience Ashland 
Imagine the ideal future for Ashland's recreational offerings and cultural spaces, events, parks, festivals, concerts, open space, athletic facilities, and cultural landmarks. One, what would you like to change? What would you like to stay the same? Two, what recreational events, programs, and places does the town offer? Three, how do arts and cultural programs enrich the Ashland community? Four, what types of gathering places exist in the town? What amenities do the spaces have? Five, how is information about community events and programs shared with residents? Just starting from the end first, the sharing, it's like I get everything, almost information overload from that, from the newsletter. You know, that it it's kind of starts out with all the business stuff and then there's all the event stuff. I'm glad it's all in one. You just, you know, that, so, but I, I don't know how, I, I, d I don't get it from anywhere else, but I, I know it's coming on Friday or Saturday and I'm, I look forward to, okay, what's happening? But I wonder how people that aren't, I don't know, maybe aren't on email, like if, if they have a, I don't know how else I would get it or how else it's out there besides that newsletter, which I, which I, I'm, that's all I need is the newsletter, but I'm not sure about other people. Um, a lot of it's social media. Yeah. Yeah. And then, With the events and stuff. Correct. And then uh, I think there are also those mini groups for cultural activities that I know that there is a gathering in ca corner spot for something. So I think there are lots of WhatsApp groups that's floating out there, and I feel like sometimes I find info from there. When you talk about social media, what do you talk? What about besides Facebook? Like I think it would be Facebook for. I don't. I don't, I don't use a lot of social media. So yeah, I don't either. Yeah, that's I why I'm. I don't know if like. I don't know if the corner spot has like an Instagram or a Twitter or X, whatever it is. Like I, I they might. I see corner spot stuff on the corner spot on Facebook. Okay. The town Facebook. Okay. When they, I follow those sites, so I see them. Pop okay. Up. Um, I mean, in terms of like envisioning what we have in 10 years, I would love to see um, like an enhancement of what we have at Stone Park. I would love to see that space really activated. It's so central. Mm. It would be so incredible. To have that, I mean, you know, you know, when I think of like Choke Park in that way, like that's we go there all the time. It's just splash pad, great playground, really beautiful sort of open walking paths, and um, I feel like Stone Park could do that in Ashland. I would love that. I would love to see that. Um, you know, enhancement at the sort of continuing to build on what's happening at the community center and having that be sort of more of a central um, space, I think, would be a great development 10 years from now. Um, see more more segments of our community, more sort of groups be able to use and leverage that space. It's, we were talking about this last meeting, like it's pretty amazing, like sneaky amazing what, what is in there. Um, yeah, those are my two. Yeah, I definitely agree with like Stone Park. That seems like a central area that, yeah, it has a playground. Yeah, it has a basketball court. Yeah, it has a pavilion. But none of it's really has a wow factor to it, right? And it could be. Yeah, and it could. Yeah. It could, really, you know. Um, so I definitely agree with that. I think, um, you know, other places like, you know, Cadillac Park, I you know, which Alvaro, I think, was involved in. Like, um, it has a lot of potential, so I'm interested in seeing what becomes of that. Even places like the dog park, you know, it is a gathering. It's yeah. a gathering place, right? So some of those things are already happening, but I think Stone Park is one of the ones where there's no, there's no plan for it. Um, yeah, so. I think a big one is... Um facilities and I feel like I'm so intrigued to see what the Y will bring to the table with that kind of thing you know, in terms of recreation and thinking of it will have an indoor pool right but I don't think and I don't think there's an outdoor pool just the, the indoor pool um, we have a lot of the indoor one. Yeah. isolated <laughs> moments and I think they are too static at this point it would be good to see how our comprehensive plan will help 
these open spaces to be a little more organic, fluid, and something that's very adaptable with the season changes. Um, it's currently too static and isolated from one another, being a, you're not a large town, we are still a small town. Um, so it'd be really good to see how the comprehensive plan will gather all the open spaces in Ashland and start to tie in these moments that when you go across the town, there is that fluidity from one end to the other and not a huge difference that all activities happen in just one corner and nothing happens in the other, so. That'd be great also to see how, I, mean, I think we talked about this before, about like different fields, like the school fields, school, like things that are part of school property can, how can things overlap a bit more just with residents being able to use those? I mean, like playgrounds at Warren, like I took my kids there all the time, right, to play at the playgrounds at morning, Warren when there wasn't school happening. And of course, it always have to be opposite of school. But if those facilities, say at the middle school or whatever, can be enriched more so that they are really an asset for both, like a shared asset between the schools and the town, you know, that, um, you, like you said, be more activated during the summer and during weekends and things like that. And we do have different generations in town, so I think be great to think about stepping back and looking at opportunities for different generations and there may be people who use the same open space in very different ways so opportunities to create for the town folks to I I like my walking path so that's where I want to be but I don't want to be in the noise of when an active kid family is there so I think opportunities for different generation I think as we we are all aging, and I think the, hopefully this comprehensive plan will open doors for every generation to be and want to be part of Ashland. Let's see. Um, arts and cultural, we don't have to. We didn't talk about that too much. I think we, we hit everything else, so we can move on or... And it kind of ties in, right? Like, we are a diverse community, so I think having that these moments will open up opportunities for different culture and cultural activities. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of cultural activities. that, Like I said, I get them in the... It'd be kind of... Uh, maybe, I know like Dolce Leche ex um, hangs artwork, local artwork, but I don't know... Like, are there other areas that maybe... Like almost like a, a little art gallery or someplace that features, well, it could be some traveling work, you know, by yeah. artists from Natick, you know, but but also featuring local artists, you know, or, I know, that would be kind of nice. I don't think we have something like yeah. that. It might just be a room, but something, I guess the library has some things like that, you know, has exhibits, um, but it could be something just for the arts as well. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, reflection on identified tensions and synergies. This would be a fun one for a planning board. The comprehensive plan contain many different elements, for example, housing, transportation, open space. There can be tensions between elements as well as synergies or ways they work together. Is it important to recognize where hopes for one element conflict or work against hopes for another element in order to brainstorm solutions to balance competing goals? An example, tension between conservation and growth a synergy between housing and economic development. What are some potential tension points or conflicts between elements of your vision and goals? What are some potential synergies or ways that elements of the plan and goals can work together? What else do you hope will be included in the comprehensive plan? That's an easy one. The yeah. ratio of built environment to open space. Um, I didn't catch the first part. The ratio of okay. built environment to open space. Yeah, I think the oh boy with just what Peter was reporting, you know, all the, the things that are upcoming, you know, it really makes me think about um, affordable housing versus overcrowding in schools, you know, um, 
or any of the town resources we've talked any about. Any of the town resources. Yeah. yeah, any of the town resources. But, you know, we obviously, we care about affordable housing. It's important. We've talked about that numerous times. But where's the, where's the balance? And if it grows so quickly, like, boy, wow, I, you know, I'm concerned, you know. Um, so I think there's also uh you know, something we talk about of all these different amenities that sometimes it's like, well, we, we want to have all these phenomenal things in our town, but we don't want anybody else to come in. We don't want any overcrowding. So it's like you're trying to make this really good town, but you don't want anyone else to live here, right? And I think that's sometimes we, something we have as a town. Like we want it to be small, but we want all these great amenities for ourselves. And that's just not how it works, right? Those things... If you have all these amenities, you have people that are going to want, want to come in, and then land that gets developed because it, it's worth, people will buy those units, right, kind of thing. So um, it's a catch-22 in a way. Yeah. How about what else do you hope will be included in the comprehensive plan? I would like to have a real sense of where people want more stuff. Density versus. Right, and it might not be residential density. I think we're gonna, that's coming anyway, but like we talked about the Pleasant Street around the train station, right? It, that it might be nice to get off the train and there's your, your local pub, right? That you just go right in, you meet, you know, whatever, or, or coffee shop on your way in or whatever it is. It might be a good place. What about, um, you know, I think, I, again, I can't remember when I, who I talked this stuff about, but like the front area of Shaw's or the front area of like where Mazi is, like along the roads, like these big parking lot and the building sits way in back. Like, can that support more little stores or offices Pop, or service? Shops, yeah. yeah, like smaller things so that you have something along the street instead of just street parking lot and then a building, but something that isn't residential necessarily, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think we got that, we may have that covered, but just, but I would like to know where people are like, yeah, we could actually use something here, you yeah. know? Or the right thing isn't here. We have some industry here, but that's not where I want to pop in with my kids, you know, kind of thing. I really hope the comprehensive plan is going to be a, real master plan for us to use um, as we grow as a town. It's going to be very hard to say we are not growing, but I hope the master plan will be a good guide, not only for planning board, but for all the community to say, you know what, this is our downtown. This is how, this are, these are things that's really special for downtown. This is 126 corridor. This is what's really great about that. And uh, I really hope that we are able to gather enough data to create this master plan that we can use moving forward. And along those lines, I, I think, um, not to, not, this isn't something to be included, but I guess to, to be very you know, specific and actionable, like because like give us a roadmap. I, I, you know this, if we have this very aspirational plan that we don't have any sort of idea how to implement or any tools to actually get ourselves there, I think that would be um, a missed opportunity. Yeah, things that will allow us to things to uh, that allow us to actually look at our look at our zoning bylaws and say, no, we're gonna zone this for this reason because the comprehensive plan said we want businesses along the strip, you know, mm -hmm. so that we actually can modify our zoning to, to, cause I'm not, sometimes I'm not sure in looking at the bylaws if what's in there is really what the town would want now versus when, whenever those bylaws were made. Yep. Right, and yeah. so it's like I think we should tweak them, but how? You yeah. know, it doesn't have to be rigid, but I think, like you said, need a roadmap, need some tools that we could use, which may evolve, but it needs 
We need one. I could help with that whenever you want. <laughs> you write the road map? I did most of the zoning. That's and a big... Yes, they do need to be updated. Mm -hmm. um... You just got my email, email address. So I, we kind of hit everything. I usually kind of end, and it's a little bit harder because we've done this over weeks. But I can quickly read, I don't know the best way, the topics, or I, I can send this out. I, full disclosure, it's on the printed form. It's it, What it does is it just keeps scrolling. So if you have section one, it'll say section one, but it just, it's weird to read. Um, but I can send that out, and then if people have other comments... Uh, maybe before I send it in. I don't know the best way to. I'm good. I don't need I to. Say, yeah, just type it up in. Yeah. No, I meant if you, because usually we do it sort of continuously, and then we I, we kind of push and try to go through it and then give people a chance to anything else, which you kind of got, but I don't know since the other topics were a, a while ago if there's anything that needs to be revisited. My guess is you, there was a pattern in all that we said in all these weeks. Um, there, it was very interesting because I, everyone has had a pattern. I'm, I mean, I can say for the public, they hit things the planning board did not, which I'm very proud of. I, you hit things the public did, but there are many things the public did that planning board did not. So it's wow. really fascinating. Yeah. No, I think that's great. I mean, yeah. things came up in CPC that didn't come up that I hadn't exactly. heard in our group. Right? Yep. So yeah, no, it's really, that's I'm awesome. We've heard many, many that overlap, and we have a consultant to smush all that together for us. Yeah, well, it's kind of, in a way, there's kind of two groups of things. The things that overlap, it's like, okay, but the, the unique one-off items mm -hmm. kind of probably really make you think. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 It'll be interesting. The next, um, well, thank you. That's great. Thank um, you. So we, we have, yeah, we have till April 26, if you... I'm just person, Peter, that person that wrote to me today, I'm like, here's the link. Could you do the survey, right? Like every person by person, just keep asking. Yeah, just to make a note, um, I did post the meeting. So next Thursday, okay. the consultant is going to have uh, our, RK, I mean, I'm sorry, RKG, uh, <laughs> Golson uh, is going to have um, a existing conditions presentation. The select board, the planning board are invited. I did post a meeting. Uh, but just to make a note, um, traditionally the comp plan was meet, is, has been meeting in the um, the basement in the library. And Kate, this is probably, I don't know if you, this is news to you, but that meeting is going to be switched to this room. And just because of in the, in the library basement, the comprehensive plan and I traditionally use the OWL. And the owl just like spins around the room. And so to fit all the people with the planning board and site board, I was going to do row seating like we already have here in this room. Now, this seating arrangement really wasn't going to work for the owl. So I kind of made, wanted to call, just kind of made the change to bring the meeting here. Having the meeting in this room allows us to have WACA, and WACA is going to come and broadcast live. And I know some of the members are going to be on on Zoom, so I'll run the Zoom meeting just like the planning board meeting. However, WACA will be able to record this, and then we'll be able to link it to our website. Okay. And so I think hopefully it will hit a larger audience uh, from the public. It'll be live. It'll be on Facebook Live, and obviously we can just post it. It'll be a higher quality, which I think is really important, rather than the owl. Especially since it seems to be more of a presentation type meeting than a small group discussion I mean meeting. it this is like the end of a phase there's three phases through their process and this is the, the like the beginning of something else but the end of a phase and and that's so yeah I, I don't it's yes, pretty I, important I think I'm a little checklist you and I Kate were planning to come in person and I think everyone else said likely zoom so for for the 18th um, I just had my window. in person um, <laughs> yeah. But I don't, she, I don't know if I have her yet, so yes. I don't, I won't be there. Yeah. It could be on WACA TV, you know what I mean? It, but if you're in the room, great. But just to give everyone the heads up, it's going to be broadcast, Facebook Live. It'll be, it'll be, it's posted. 
the meeting, the planning board meeting is posted for this room with the link. So it should be all hopefully all set. All right. Anything else remaining, members? <laughs> so you have a public comment. Is it just something that we are oh. skipping? Last thing on the list, I have public comment. Do you have any public comment, Mark? Yep. <laughs> I figured he was waiting for it. <laughs> One time to the mic, you know. <laughs> Can't sit down and then go back up again. <laughs> One time to Mark. <laughs> One time to, to Mark. Mark. Okay. Thank you. Mark Sony, 49 Hawthorne Rose. This is directed to our town planner. It's one question, which I didn't get a reply from yet. Okay, can I, can I speak to him? Please, 100%. Okay. It's on the agenda, but it never got discussed. So I'm gonna bring out the questions. Mr. Matchek, Peter, did you get my email? You know what, Mark, I'm not gonna lie, I've gotten a lot of emails, it's been a crazy week. Okay. So let me dig through them tomorrow. It was about the wildwood mix use. Okay. And what I wanted to bring up the questions, and I was looking at that. What it was on the agenda tonight, and I was going to ask the questions. Was anything going to be changed on it? And no. Is the is the zoning board going to be involved in this? In this. So the chain, so the Wildwood, so the Wildwood District, right? Which was dis, which, so the Wildwood District, right, encompasses a very large swath, right, and that would include the the Wildwood District. Mark has a couple different subsects, right, and so what we were doing with the MBTA zoning was pretty much picking the one parcel of land, which was 100 Chestnut, which that development is going on to satisfy the MBTA. Now, it was cherry picked, right? Because it had the density and it had the acreage. And so it had the unit count and it was about six acres, right? And so it, it fit the bill. But to do that, you had to create its own new subsect, right? Because I could not select the entire parcel which Village of the Americas encompassed, right? Now, if I included all of Village of the Americas and all that acreage, I wouldn't have the density that would have fit the MBTA regulations. So to create, to, so, so to take that parcel of land and to take that development to use it within our calculations, I had to cherry pick it and create a new subsect, a new parcel called the Wildwood Mixed Use District to therefore then satisfy MBTA requirements. And by Wildwood Mix Special Districts. Yep. 8.6, to tell you, I did look it up. There's a table of usage. Yep. Is that gonna be broken down, changed around? You know, I have to go back and look at it off the top of my head right now, yep. but it was not the, it was, it was not the, um, when we when we did all the zoning work for this, we did not we we mirrored it. However, we we also there was a couple ones that really didn't make sense, so we just didn't pull those right over. But what we did pull over were all the items that would have worked to meet the MBTA criteria. And would the the subcommittee redesign committee be involved in this? So it really wasn't from a design perspective, Mark. It was really for a compliance method. Okay, okay. I'll leave that as, as a no. It's okay. Okay. And um, and, and is there any, for doing this, is, is there going to be a change of purpose and reason? And you just told me you're cherry picking, basically, for the, M the MBTA zoning. Yeah, I'm cre not quote-unquote cherry picking, right? I am creating a district. So that's the purpose. I'm creating a district to meet the compliance of the to, to to add those units and add that acreage into my MBT into Ashland's MBTA compliance model. 
So I'm creating, we're creating a new district yes. to add into the compliance model to help Ashland meet compliance for MBT communities. So in the bylaw, is that bylaw going to be changed? Well, that's going to be a debate uh, for the planning board at the next meeting. And I think that is also going to be uh, up to the planning board to either the, to vote to either support or to not support the proposed zoning bylaw. And again, before I sit and I'll fall asleep again or whatever, I am willing to help because I know all about these zonings and Wildwood was one of the ones that was very intricate at the time. That was with the Vision of Americas and Fafford mm -hmm. property. Mark, that, that was the most, one of the most complicated projects that, that I've had to iron out um, with this 900 Chesson Street project. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think that was our last agenda item. So I will make a motion that we adjourn at 1045. Is there a second? Second that. Let's take a roll call vote. Deepa Wanka, aye. Catherine Jerzyk, aye. Amanda Hayes, aye. And Trisha Kendall, aye. Let's get out of here. Yeah, thank you. Mac, are you sleeping back there, bud? Huh? <laughs> 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 <laughs>